Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the End Times Bible Conference. We are at the much-anticipated Saturday night debate, and I thank you all for being here. What's awesome to see is that we have people here from all over the world. There was somebody here that came all the way from Thailand, which is awesome. It's great to see God's children coming out to uh, seek the truth. And tonight we were going to address a very important question in regards to the end times. Are they, is it, end times, is it in the past? Is it in the future? And why does it matter? Now tonight we have two awesome men of God that have taken their time to come out and, and present two very different perspectives. So I hope that you came here tonight to be challenged. Because a faith that cannot be challenged is a faith that cannot be trusted. And the Bible says that two, as iron sharpens iron, two men sharpen another. When we come together, if you, if you know anything about iron sharpening iron, there's friction there. But at the end of the process, both pieces come out better and sharper. So my prayer for you tonight is that you are challenged that you don't believe a word you say here, but you go out and study it for yourself. Because we should all be asking ourselves, why do we believe what we believe? If I ask both of our participants to stand up, I would like for you to introduce yourselves. Um, to my right is Pastor Mike Miano of Blue Point Bible Church. To briefly introduce myself, I am Michael Miano. I'm pastor here of Blue Point Bible Church as well as director of the Power of Preterism Network. I came to understand and agree with the full preterist position in 2010 after much challenging of my own views as well as what the scriptures actually have to say in contrast to what I thought they were saying. Since that time, being burdened with what I have come to see as a necessary reformation in the body of Christ, I have passionately and zealously defended and presented the full preterist position in the pulpit, in evangelism, in debates, every year since 2013, online radio shows, my personal show, Miano Gone Wild, as well as guests on other shows and through books and resources. On his website, Mr. Whitset claims to offer a balanced look at what the scriptures teach, distinguishing essential from non-essential, to not to condemn the person or the group, but to expose the error of the doctrine, the theology, and the eschatology. If that be the case, we must respect that about Brother Whitset this evening. I will here refer to him as Brother Stephen. Or Steve? Steve is fine. All right. We must respect that. Despite our disagreement, I would agree that the ministry here and my ministry here at Blue Point Bible Church, as well as my personal work through the Power of Preterism Network, aims at exactly that. As Titus chapter 1 verse 9 remarks, as a minister of the gospel, I aim to hold fast to and teach pure and sound doctrine and rebuke those who oppose it. Therefore, this will hardly be a debate, because when we establish tonight what the gospel is, according to scripture in its proper historical context, Mr. Whitset will have to agree with what the full preterist position, or what is known as covenant eschatology, has not only to say, but what it offers to Christians who take their stand upon the truth. I will be affirming that full preterism is a valid understanding of the scripture in regards to the end times. What that means is that according to my understanding and position on scripture, I believe and affirm that the end times events, final coming of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the change or transformation spoken about in the New Testament were indeed fulfilled in the past. Also, I will aim to show you details tonight as to why futurism, with all that it offers, does not set up Christians for success in understanding nor living in the reality that we have been offered by Jesus Christ. Our goal tonight should be to study and rightly divide the scriptures to find what these men of old, the writers of these inspired writings in our New Testament as well as our Old Testament, were saying to their primary audience, not demanding what we think or want to think the scriptures say. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 through 17, all scripture is inspired by God profitable for teaching, for correction, for rebuke, for reproof, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. In the same writing, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Apostle Paul elaborates, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, 
rightly dividing the word of truth. What that makes clear to us tonight is that there is a wrong way to divide the scriptures, or to translate the term, there is a wrong way to handle or to properly present the scriptures. The man or woman, to bring things into our modern context, who studies and rightly divides the word of truth need not be ashamed. And if one does not study, study these things out, they should be ashamed. The reason being, essentially, we can twist and turn the texts found in the Bible to mean anything we want. And many have done this, sometimes unaware, rather than honestly studying, wrestling, and reforming our views according to the context of Scripture. The re responsible way to study your Bible is to come to understand how these details would have been understood in their proper historical context. Only then we can understand our Bible. This is called audience relevance. If we fail to search out and study these details, we end up leaning on our own understanding, that which has led many astray, and then we are stuck with teachings and perspectives that quite possibly someone else made up, or worse yet, we made up. I don't believe I have to provide the multitude of examples where we find the failed efforts of man when they rely upon their own understanding. Full preterism establishes the faithfulness of God, the inspiration and infallibility of Scripture, as well as the truthfulness and the wisdom of Jesus Christ's teachings in regards to the end times. It is my goal tonight to win your hearts and your minds to the truth of Scripture. All the audience and even Mr. Whitsett, as well as empower your walk with Christ and biblically clarify how we should be living for the glory of God. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, everybody. I am Stephen Whitsett. I am a licensed, ordained minister with the Foursquare Gospel. I spent um, my first 28 years of ministry in L.A. as a youth pastor, working on the streets of Hollywood, working with kids under the underpass. I, I've been through all of that. I've sat with prostitutes broken on, on, on street corners. I've seen lives changed like I, you, you can't believe. And I've seen God do it in a heartbeat, in a minute, change lives. Um, I've, my, my background is, is in theology. That's my first degree, MBA, was in systematic theology. My second one I'm working on right now is uh, my NDIV at the Grand Canyon University. Um, and so I'm pursuing that. And uh, in the meantime, I'm cooking. I'm raising two daughters and I have a wife. About four years ago, now I'm not raised dispensational. I was not raised in a system where I was taught, where I sat in a class and said, it's pre, the rapture comes there, and all of those things. We sat through a class that explained the events and said, how do you see that? And my professors were this is theology, this is how we put soteriology, pneumatology, and all those things together. These are the basics. These kind of overriding principles is how you understand the Bible. So that's how my background is. And so I'm, I'm saying that because um, I'm not going to be the same as, as dispensational. My answers are not going to be dispensational answers. My viewpoint is not in that perspective whatsoever. And so oftentimes when I, I'm debating and I'm talking with people, they automatically assume you're a futurist, you're dispensational, and they will attack me on those things. And I've read, I've read all the books. I mean, I've got just about every one of their... I've got just about every one of Don's. I've got just about every one of, of Ed's books. I've read them all because somebody brought it up to me about four years ago. I did everything I could to learn everything I could, which means I engaged Don, I've engaged Ed um, a few times, um, and others. And a couple of times, I think I might have lost with Jerry Bowers, but I don't know if I'm going to ever apologize. <laughs> but, and just as he said, I have seen preterist attack right and left. But me, myself, I'm the one going into the lion den. And because, yeah, futurist in a preterist website, yeah, nine out of ten times I'll get kicked out in a few, you know, after a few posts. But those who allow me to sit there and stay, I don't come in there and this is my position, you're wrong. It's got to be, this is why I'm saying this. 
Does that make any sense to you? And I want an answer back. I'm not here to, even tonight, I'm not here to convince anybody of my position. I'm here to discuss and to um, look at and open up and, and see things from a different perspective. The glass is half full. And somebody who yells at me and tells me the glass is half empty, they can say that all they want to. But all I'm saying is, is the glass also is half full. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. They're both true. And so with that said, um, a little bit of my background and where I approach things, just so that you know and how I'm answering, is that I agree with Don Preston and the others who sit there and say that 70 AD was a coming and not a physical coming. Got that? It was a coming of judgment. It was something that came from a vindicated Lord. I agree that uh, everything that was done, and I looked at that scripture because I, I was forced to, just as some of you guys were, this generation, you can't escape that. So I look at all of that, and I'm going to examine this. Why is it this generation, everything, all those things got to be in there. Why is it though the early church fathers saw that and still believed in a second coming? What was that? So that's what forced me into it and, and looking at it, and I will save a little bit more why a little bit later. Excellent. Let's give both these men a round of applause. And let's quickly go through the uh, format uh, this evening so you know exactly what to expect. We're going to begin with um, five-minute opening remarks, starting with uh, Pastor Miano. Um, and then uh, followed by a round where Pastor Miano will go ahead and affirm his position. Um, that will be 15 minutes. And then Mr. Witsit will also have 15 minutes to uh, rebut Pastor Miano. And likewise, uh, there will be followed by 15 minutes of Mr. Witsit affirming his position and uh, Pastor Miano also um, uh, rebutting that. That will be followed by a cross-examination where uh, each uh, uh, each individual will uh, be able to um, ask as many questions as possible within a 15 minute time frame. Uh, the, uh, 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 the answers uh, must be limited to five minutes. And after that we're going to take a 10 minute break where you the audience is going to put together some questions. So there will be a period of audience participation. I do ask you now listen, I know that this is a topic that has uh, a lot of folks very passionate and rightfully so, but I ask you to uh, operate in decency and order this evening, as we should. Likewise, I encourage uh, both of our participants to treat one another and interact with one another in a way that would glorify God, which uh, I have no doubt that will be the case. So we will go ahead and uh, take some time to answer some questions uh, from the audience, closing statements, and uh, then we will head home. But again, I believe from the bottom of my heart that tonight you will be challenged and embrace that because we honor God when we seek Him. Let us pray before we get started. Father God, above all, we want to glorify you this evening. Lord, I pray for every heart here that it be open. I come against a hardened heart tonight. I just pray for an open heart and an open mind. Lord God, I pray over both of these men, and I pray that the peace that surpasses all understanding would guard their heart and their mind, and that truth today would, be, would prevail, and that anything that is false be exposed. But again, Lord, we want to reaffirm that more important than anything, we want to honor you this evening. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And we begin with Pastor Miano and your opening remarks. I, um, I gave my opening five minutes. Okay. So can I just move into my 15 minutes? I, I gave my five minute opening. I, I thought that's what I was already doing. Well, so. No, go, take your full 15. Go for the 15? Oh, sure. Okay. All right, you called an audible All right, I'm going to uh, present my 15-minute affirmative of why full preterism is the proper view. I, I think I'm messing up what it was supposed to be on the paper there. Um, may I read that just real quickly? <laughs> I uh, just want to, um, again, I'm going to be offering the affirmative that the end times events, the final coming of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the change spoken about or the transformation spoken about in the New Testament have indeed occurred in the past, that they've been fulfilled in the past. 
Thank you. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has remarked that the one advantage that the 21st century Bible student has over their predecessors is that it is now being realized that Jesus must be understood in his primary first century Jewish context. Church history is littered with councils, reformations, and revivals that challenge the church to change their views in many areas, which highlights the ever-reforming nature of the Christian church. Yet there has never been a council, a reformation, nor a revival that has squared away the details of the last things, that which is known as eschatology, which we are debating tonight. I wouldn't simply limit this to eschatology, though. The, every word and teaching of Scripture must be understood in the Hebraic context from which it comes to us. This has been noted by many New Testament scholars such as Mark Nanos, Tom Holland, and John Walton, to name a few. It has only been since the 1950s that we've actually had a host of information regarding ancient Near Eastern literature and thought. Noting all of this, it may be necessary that we move away from what we have heard the gospel to be and instead go to the scriptures in their historical context as our source. So, when we open up the Bible, we are immersed into the creation story and the worldview of the Hebrew people. This story begins with Adam and is lived through the lineage of Jacob's descendants, the 12 tribes of Israel. As you follow the narrative of Genesis, you come to God's choosing Israel, his people. He gives them a law of blessings and curses. You read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. What we read through the Old Testament is the historical story, an example of how Israel of the flesh was called to live according to law, to be the wisdom and understanding of God to the nations around them. Again, you could read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And how they failed and inherited curses. The prophets continue to rebuke Israel again and again, yet they offer them a glimmer of hope, the time of the Messiah, the soon coming kingdom of God. Romans chapter 8 verses 3 through 4 pretty much sums up the Old Testament and the transition into the New. It says, For the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It is important to note that Jesus Christ said himself that he was sent only to the lost house of Israel. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. And he even instructed his disciples to not go amongst the Gentiles, rather only to the lost tribes of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. The apostle Paul establishes this as well in Romans chapter 9, wherein he laments his kinsmen according to the flesh, Israel, and their rejection of Jesus Christ. He laments that he would rather be accursed, separated from Christ, than to see his descendants according to the flesh miss out on the hope of the kingdom. The gospel. Because the covenants, the law, the promises, the fathers, even Christ, belong to them. The Apostle Paul further clarifies this point in Romans chapter 15, wherein he says, For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. God made promises to Israel of the flesh through what we call the Old Covenant the Law and the Prophets. The fulfillment of those promises to both the living and the dead, a phrase we may have to qualify and explain tonight, would be known as the Kingdom of God. This is where God would declare, I am your God and you are my people. Essentially the reality you read about in Revelation chapters 21 through 22. During the time of Christ in the first century, there was so much confusion in regards to how these promises would be fulfilled. It was known as the mystery of the ages. How would the reality of the kingdom of God be made manifest? The difference in expectations marked the division between the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and notably the Christians. For we declare the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man seeks it. Luke chapter 16 verse 16. The kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say here or there, for the kingdom of God is within you. Luke chapter 17 verses 20 through 21. Again, I mentioned the major reason this debate is even happening is the common confusion regarding the historical narrative found in the Bible and how that applies to us. Not to mention the failure to understand how the kingdom of God would be made manifest. Brother Steve will seek to focus your minds on seemingly physical things or spiritual, but you see and feel them physically, however that may work. When we come to understand what is, what is happening in the New Testament, 
that the details are the fulfillment of the expectations found in the Old Testament, things become clear. And that should be our goal tonight. The goal of the gospel, the eschatological end times, events that would make the gospel complete, was not to further confuse those of us who would come to the Father through Christ, nor keep us hoping for a deferred hope. Instead, the goal was clarity and fulfillment. Everything in Scripture was moving toward a goal. We see this explained a bit in Galatians chapter 3. To sum it up, the law was given to move toward the goal of everything being summed up in Christ and fulfilled in Christ. Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. We are not, provided, we are not privileged to replace, make up, or distort that goal or the events leading to it. No matter what favorite Bible passage we cling to, what our favorite Bible teacher, church fathers, New Testament scholars, or creeds say. So we must look to the Old Testament for the details we are debating tonight. The Apostle Paul said himself that he proclaimed nothing other than what was hoped for and found in the Law and the Prophets. Again, you could read this in Acts chapter 23, Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 26, and you can even see it cited in Acts chapter 28 where the, go the gospel is clearly the hope of Israel. Also, many of the New Testament texts we will be discussing tonight written by the, were written by the Apostle Paul. Therefore, our understanding and definition must be found in the Law and the Prophets. For the rest of this opening statement, I aim to clarify the expectations that are found in the Law and the Prophets regarding last things. The coming of the Lord, the resurrection of the dead, and the transformation of God's people. In Genesis chapter 11 and, and chapter 18, we read of the Lord coming down to see and judge what was being done in Babel as well as in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is understood as a Hebraic expression of God seeing and bringing judgment upon the wickedness found in those places. We read of the Lord's coming to judge Pharaoh and Egypt in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. And this coming was manifest through plagues, which led to Israel leaving Egypt. In Hosea chapter 8, verse 1, we read of the Lord coming to judge his people who had rebelled, which we understand to have happened to the northern tribes of Israel at the hands of the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Isaiah chapter 19 declares a coming of the Lord into Egypt. And sure enough, this happened at the hands of the Assyrians in 671 B.C. In Isaiah chapter 34 and Abadiah chapter 1, we read of a rather blood-soaked, cataclysmic coming of the Lord into Edom. And this happened at the hands of the Babylonians and the Babylonian armies in 600 B.C. We read in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel details of the coming of the Lord into Jerusalem, the house of Judah, and we know that this happened at the hands of the Babylonian armies in 586 B.C. In Matthew chapter 23, we read a rather long indictment pronounced upon the religious leaders in first century Jerusalem by Jesus Christ himself. He says, So you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure in the guilt of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all of these things will come upon this generation. Matthew chapter 23, verses 31 through 38. It is in this context of judgment being pronounced against Jerusalem that the disciples of Christ ask him, When will these things happen? Again, judgment upon Jerusalem. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They understood these details. After all, these were their expectations, their hopes. They were very familiar with the law and the prophets and knew that a time of restoration was promised. And a coming of the Lord was promised before that restoration. Remember when Christ was born and it was prophesied about him that he would be the consolation of Israel, the redemption of Jerusalem. He would cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. You can see this in Luke chapter 2. John the Baptist and Jesus Christ both spoke of and pointed to a coming of the Lord, the wrath of God, and they never redefined the already understood expression. And it would be false for us to do so tonight. 
Jesus Christ told his disciples when that coming would happen. He told them that they would not finish proclaiming and preaching the gospel in all the cities of Israel before the coming of the Lord. Matthew chapter 10, verse 23. He said that some standing in front of him would be alive. They would not taste death until they seen him coming in his kingdom with his angels and bringing judgment. Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28. He told them that that generation would not pass away until all those things were fulfilled. Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 through 34. Sure enough, when we study the scriptures and we take a look at the history of that time, we find that the Roman armies surrounded the city beginning in A.D. 66, which Jesus warned his followers about. And sure enough, if we study the history, we see his followers fled the city of Jerusalem. They knew that this was that time. This was the coming of the Lord that was anticipated. All the details of Matthew chapter 24 were fulfilled between the years of A.D. 64 and 70, and not one stone was left upon another. The question we must explore tonight is what did that accomplish? How did the coming of the Lord in AD 70 fulfill the consolation of Israel, the hope of Israel, or the restoration of all things that was expected by the law and the prophets? Ultimately, the coming of the Lord would bring judgment upon that city. However, this would also initiate the gathering together, the Greek term harpazo, of God's people with him in a fully consummated kingdom of God, wherein the dead and the living would be brought into his presence and shall dwell with him forever. The hope of Israel, this is detailed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As we begin to talk about the resurrection of the dead tonight, we must be sure that we are speaking about that which the prophets hoped for. It would take all evening to go through the prophets with you. However, I have provided a handout. Prayerfully, each and every one of you have received it. And I have provided this for my opening statement, and I believe I've given you enough verses in the Old Testament to prove what that restoration and resurrection that the Old Testament prophets hoped for was. Jesus Christ came into the world offering life and salvation to his people if they put their faith and hope in him. In doing this, professing Christ, they went from death to life. Jesus said, truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Again, we see in 1 John chapter 3 verse 14, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers. He that loves not his brother abides in death. So the living went from death to life by professing faith in Christ. But what about the dead ones? I believe I have made it clear that Christ came to fulfill the details and promises given to those under the old covenant. The Apostle Paul emphatically said Christ came as a servant to the circumcision, Old Testament, to confirm the promises given to the father, forefathers. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. From the time of Christ's work on the cross to the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the age, the saints were experiencing what is called the already but not yet. They had eternal life. They had salvation. However, that reality would not be made fully complete until the forefathers experienced resurrection as well. The writer of Hebrews clarifies this point for us. In verses 39 through 40 of chapter 11, it says, And these, having gained approval through their faith, Old Testament saints, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, first century saints, so that apart from us, they, Old Testament saints, would not be made perfect. The resurrection of the dead, which is found in the Gospels, Romans chapters 7 through 8, 1 Corinthians chapters 5, chapter 15, as well as Philippians chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 20, speaks of a time when the death, or the curse of death that kept the people of God in bondage, would be taken away. A corporate promise to the people of God, the living and the dead. The context of that death and the promise are found in Isaiah chapter 25 as well as Hosea chapter 13. These are the texts the Apostle Paul quotes from when explaining the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The living and the dead being brought into better promises, wherein the presence of God was with his people, him being their God, and them being his people, is and was the restoration of all things. Understanding the transition of covenants, the goal was the goal of the people of God. The end times, events of judgment, resurrection, and the transformation are not something we are looking forward to. Instead, these are events that were fulfilled in the first century to make it clear who the sons of God were and are. The old covenant system came under judgment just as Jesus Christ said it would. The saints were saved from that judgment physically by heeding the wisdom of Christ and eternally rest in the new covenant reality made known to us and consummated through the work of Christ. Israel was called to be the wisdom and understanding of God to the nations around them. In the natural they failed. They fell victim to curses. However, in and through Christ, 
and all the events that would consummate the new covenant, we have been restored to that reality with no curse. What the heritage of Adam lost through sin was restored through Jesus Christ, being in the presence of God, living for his glory, and prospering. My time. All right, I'm supposed to respond to that, right? You sure? Okay. Let me have a little quote here from N.T. Wright. He says in uh, Surprised by Hope, page 126, it says, Nor will it do to say, as do some who grasp part of the point, but have not worked it through, that the events of A.D. 70 were themselves the second coming of Jesus, so that ever since then we have been living in God's new age, and there is no further coming to await. This may seem to many readers, as indeed it seems to me, a bizarre position to hold. But there are some who not only hold it, but also eagerly propagate it and use some of my arguments to support it. This results from a confusion. If the text that speaks of the Son of Man coming on the clouds refers to AD 70, as I have argued that in part they do, this doesn't mean that the AD 70 was the second coming, because the Son of Man texts aren't second coming texts at all. Despite the frequent misreading that way, they are about Jesus' vindication, and Jesus' vindication in his resurrection, ascension, and judgment on Jerusalem. Now, let me explain this. I like to walk around, but I'll, I'll stay here. Um, what, he is, what he goes on to say there, and this is in response, second coming. When we look at that text, Son of Man coming on clouds, absolutely right. Coming on clouds has everything to do with judgment coming. Son of Man is a title that comes from Daniel 7, 13, 14. It was the Son of Man who was coming into the presence of God. And he was given a throne. But the language there is very specific. I'm going to see if I can pull him. It says that he was presented for before the Ancient of Days. He came into his presence on clouds. And so what N.T. is arguing, and after my examination of Matthew 24 and 31, well, how in the world can you sit there and say... Um, that's what everybody says is the second coming. That's the promise right there. But how do the other church fathers not believe that? What did they miss? What did I miss? Let's look at it. So if he's invoking that passage, which is not a second coming passage, but it is talking about Christ ascending into heaven and giving and becoming king. He's sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And because they killed him, he in turn is sending judgment back on them for their rejection of him. So the passage in Matthew 16, where he's before Caiaphas, he said, from this point forward, you will see me sitting at the right hand of God. And the right hand always means what? Judgment. Authority. I share the authority. Yeah. And so he has the right to judge. John um, chapter 5, 26, 27, he says, it says he has self-existing. He has life within himself. And because he, has, because he is the Son of Man, he has the right to judge. So if that passage is not about the second coming, then the, is Jesus, when he quotes it, is he talking about his vindication, his ascension, his ascension into heaven and being vindicated in that way, and the promise of judgment coming? Or is he talking about his second coming? See, we would say, no, it's not about the second coming. And I'll explain why in a little bit more, why I would, I would disagree with that. But... When you look at Caiaphas and what he said, and when every time you see the Son of Man coming on clouds, and many of the time texts, many of those time texts are definitely about 70 AD. I'm not going to argue with that. You're dead right. That's what they are about. And no, there was no promise in Matthew 24 about a resurrection, was there? It says he would gather. What did we find out from church history? Um, book 3 from Eusebius, 11.1. It says that the because the Christians were warned beforehand to do what? Flee. They fled to Pella, and that's where they lived. James was crucified, and Eusebius says that Clopas took over the church. And the church continued to survive and, and continued to live there in Jerusalem, as well as all the other countries. Now, I'm looking at your notes to make sure I'm going in there. When we're talking about the, um, 
the Bible, he made the statement of about it was written in a Hebrew context. Well, what I would like to point out is that Luke, for instance, was Greek. He wrote his book to a Greek audience. And he explained to them in, in a simple way, in somebody who was not even a Christian, about what the gospel was. Most of the letters were written to Romans, Corinthians. And if we look through Acts, what we see is that Paul went from city to city. And he would start to preach in the synagogues. And when the Judaizers come in and beat him up and do all of that, he would dust his feet off and he would go to the Gentiles. So the majority of the churches were built around Gentiles. They didn't have that Hebrew understanding. Why would they? They're, they're Greeks. They've grown up in a Greek society. That explains Paul when he came to Corinth. And, they, and he performed a couple miracles. And they all started to fall down and say, Oh, you must be a god. And he tore his clothes and said, No, no, I'm a man just like you. I'm here to preach the gospel. I'm here to tell you this is the Jesus that, w that was resurrected. And concerning the mysteries, I understand that Paul quoted the Old Testament. He quoted it all the time. But he says that um, in several places, and I'll read a couple to you maybe. Um, Romans 11.25 I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening of the part. And he goes on. Paul mentions this quite a few times. I'm here to reveal a mystery to you that you have not known before. And that is also expressed in the idea of that in Jewish thought, they expected two things to happen. They didn't see Jesus as one person. They saw him as two different people. The suffering servant, the Lamb of God who would be slain. They saw that. Then they also saw what? The king who would sit on David's throne forever. How can you be the suffering servant and die and still be the king on the cross? They looked at that and said, two different people. And did they expect a kingdom, a physical kingdom on this earth to happen when he came back? That was the whole point of what Judas was doing. He's forcing God's hand. I'll betray him. That way he'll have to rise up. He'll have to get an army up and we can go back like the old King David did. You know, get the army just like they did in the Old Testament. So I'm going to force his hand. It didn't work out. The expectation of them of seeing him become a king was also in Acts 1. What did he say as he was about to get ready to ascend into heaven? He said to them, or they asked him, he said, uh, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? And what were they talking about? The, the throne of David. Are you going to restore it here? What was Jerusalem, um, Palm Sunday all about? It was about him riding in a donkey. That was the king riding in. But he rode on a donkey, not on a horse. Kings who come in on a horse means I'm here to war and start a fight and all that. A king who comes on a donkey meant peace. He came in peace through there, but they all thought he came to do what? To set that kingdom up. He's the Messiah. That's what we understand. And when that didn't happen, Judas went to force his hand. And we know what happened. He gave his life willingly. Now, when it comes to the second coming then, if there was no promise in those passages, anytime you see Son of Man coming on the planet, and there's no promises of a second coming, what we have to look at then, okay, then that this 70 AD was not the second coming. Well, how do you know? What's, what's the real thing? I hear it time and time again, people read the scriptures. And he did too, and he, and he talked about that. It says that he will appear at his coming in 2 Thessalonians 2. He will appear. John says what? John, 1, uh, 1 John 3, 2. When he appears, we shall see him as it is. Now, one of the basic principles and the foundations of preterism that I've learned, and I'm telling you, I learn, I'm having to learn everything because almost every person's got something different in how they view that and how they perceive that. But the common understanding that I'm hearing is that when I say the word see, they say it's perceived. Well, it's just a perception. It's a mind understanding. But when they were walking with him on the road to Galilee, and he was talking to him about the scriptures, did he not sit there and say to them, and explain, 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 explain scriptures to him, but they did not know who he was. And then their eyes were opened. And then they understood, this is Christ. How is it we didn't recognize? 
there was a, a revealing there that was going on. In the same way, it says when he is going to appear, we don't know what... He, it hasn't happened yet, so we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what it's going to be like. But when he appears, we're going to see him. And every eye is going to see him. That word right there for appearing is, is the word epiphania. And it means to manifest. It means to be made visible. Second Thessalonians 4. Jesus himself descends. Acts 1. This same Jesus will come. So what we hold to is the idea that it's a very, and I'm not even arguing for a physical coming right now, but I'm saying it's a physical glorious appearing. Because here's what I have a picture in mind, and this is the picture I get in, I, the picture I get in scriptures, is that it's a glorious display. You've got the beast and his system. They surround Jerusalem, and he comes in a display with his saints not him by himself even. It says the saints come with him. Zechariah uh, fourteen three. It talks about him and his saints coming. And defeats the beast. And destroys him. To me it all rests around right there. That's what the early church fathers believed. That it was a physical coming. That they saw him. And he, when he appeared. Real quickly. Resurrection. The same thing. Matthew twenty seven fifty two. It has an example of the saints that were resurrected. Here's a quick thought to challenge your thinking. And I've mentioned it to a couple of people here. Some people have said that those in Hades and Sheol were not released until 70 AD. But we have a resurrection that happened in, 20, in Matthew 27, 52, after his resurrection. Many of the graves were opened up and the dead came out and they were seen by many. Where did those people's souls come from? had to come from Sheol. They were released. The captives were made captive and set free. So if they're set free, here they are. When did that first fruit happen? And then the second question you've got to happen, uh, ask yourself is, is that God provided redemption and the forgiveness of sins by his shed blood, didn't he? Then are we going to sit and say that blood only covered a certain amount of people and they got to come out? Or is it everybody who looked forward to the promises, Hebrew 11 says, in faith, they looked forward. Hear Christ. And this is the picture I get. I've read a lot of books. Lord of the Rings, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I read. And I see pictures. And what I see is Christ descending down in hell and saying, hey, I have the keys to death and to hell. You no longer have to stay here. Come with me. We're going. We're out of here. You don't have to stay here anymore. And they were resurrected right there in the first fruits. All of them came out. And if they came out and physically walked around, then people are going to look at that and say, that's what resurrection is? Well, resurrection of the dead is anastasis necron. The standing again of a corpse. A lot of people say dead ones. But the necron, we know the word. Necrophilia, ne necro necropsy, it's all about a dead body. And that's where that word gets its central meaning from and talking about that. And it's a technical term that talks the body coming out. So we see that as very physical. The second thing, the last point within two minutes here, is the change. If those people walked out and changed, now at Christ coming and says there's that first resurrection, then if he has changed, those that come out of that, and it says we who are alive are changed for this body will put on, that is mortal, will put on immortality. And this perishable body will put on imperishability. Romans 6, 29, he says, Jesus, after coming out of the grave, being resurrected, cannot die again because he has defeated death. So therefore, there's the immortal. There's the idea that we have when we are raised and when that resurrection would have happened, it would have been a physical resurrection. Those tombs would have come out and everybody would have come out and walked. And it says both groups are gathered. Those who are alive, we who are alive. Paul assumed he would have been there for that. Expectation. Man, we live with the expectation too of some of those things. But we who are alive will be changed. And if they become immortal, if they become imperishable, that means they cannot die. Now, somebody asked me, well, what's the whole purpose for that? Because... In, in my position, what I'm saying is, is that the reason that Jesus comes is to create that kingdom on earth that they questioned about in Acts 1. To set that kingdom up here on earth for that thousand years. That's, to me, that's the purpose. I'll uh, let it go.
Mr. Whitson, according to the uh, current format, you uh, can continue for some time and then go ahead and reaffirm your position as well. You offer application. Oh, yeah, okay. The second part. Why, I'm going to put this in here so I don't have to hold it. Why, now, I'll speak to my, uh, from the heart here for a second because, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a little bit hard um, to sit back and, and I understand there's this tension between futurists and preterists. And what we hear is not sometimes the same things that you hear. And what I hear sometimes is, is that we've got a better revelation of God than you do. We have a better understanding than you do. That's where the tension comes in. That's where we, we go at it and that's where tempers flare because, well, it becomes a, a little bit of a divisive thing. So if we want to address what is the difference, what makes it in better or this better or mine better or anything else, let me explain it this way. And, th and this is the best thing I, I can do. Yes, he's right. We talk about it physically. Because we look for the hope and the, the redemption. Larry Siegel posted not too long ago his view on covenant eschatology, and he put in there, um, and he talked about it, and I can pull it up. I'm one of those people, if you say something, I'll probably paste and copy it and keep it. But Larry said, covenant eschatology celebrates the victory of God in the redemption, reconciliation, and restoration of what was lost through the entrance of sin, death, into the world through Adam. The symphony of God's purpose of the ages is traced to the progressive unfolding of redemptive history having been promised before the ages began, from Genesis to Revelation. Here's my question. He says, the restoration of all things. What was lost in the garden? By Adam's sin. What was he pronounced? The ground was cursed with thorns and thistles. Number two, you came from the dust, you will go to the dust. Physical death, correct? And what was the third thing? In child labor. But then the promise was also given about Christ too, wasn't it? If we are talking about the restoration of all things and we're talking about going back and restoring all of creation to his intended purposes for it. To the way it was before the fall. That's how I, uh, I see restoration because you can sit there and say we're living in the new heavens and the new earth right now where there is no sickness, no disease. Spiritually, I agree. I'm not going to argue with that. But physically, has it been restored? No, I still deal with suffering and sicknesses. Correct? We're growing older. Those things are still there. So the hope of the future is, is, is our vindication that when Christ comes back, and I'm not the dispensational, I don't believe that we're, we have to go through wrath. I don't believe that. But I also know that, that Revelation 13, it talks about, and he gives power over the church to persecute them for three and a half years. Why does the church need judgment? I'm looking at it right now. I don't know if you see the same things. Maybe you do. But I don't go to people and tell them I'm a pastor because it doesn't mean anything. Well, you could be just like those other pedophiles and everything else, can't you? You could be just like them. I can't say that because it no longer has that moral high road that it used to have. The church is in such a mess right now. Right, 26,000 denominations. Yes, everybody fighting and arguing with each other. Do we not think that the church needs to be judged? Don't we need something coming in? So I expect that judgment to happen, but I also expect Christ to return. And I expect him to set that kingdom up there. And we who were beheaded for our faith. Revelations 19. I saw the souls of that were beheaded. They were raised. They came to life. This is the first resurrection. And they ruled and reigned with Christ for that thousand years. That's what I see. And if we're reigning with him, that's our vindication. That is where we're going. That is the hope 
uh, uh, that we look forward to. It's not, and then, and then the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. The new heavens and the earth is made. And so the hope of, of everything is, is that I don't see the physical terrible in the way he created because he said in Genesis 1, everything that he made was very good. Then why did he send his son down in flesh to experience the same things that we did, correct? There's a perspective there. There's something happens that when we're living in the flesh that is different from living as a spirit. And there's things that we can enjoy, the creation of God. And I believe the new heavens and the new earth is about enjoying the creation that God created. Being able to eat. Being able to have the animals around us and not killing us. That's what I see is the new heavens and the new earth. I know there's a lot of great disagreements, on it, but that's the picture that I, I see. And we're in a physical body, we're there. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. I want to begin by reading what the Apostle Paul encouraged believers in Ephesus with. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. That should be the goal of any Christian presentation of the gospel, exactly what the Apostle Paul just said. I'm sure that Brother Steve and I would agree on that part at least, that that should be our goal. However, the Apostle Paul also made it clear again and again that he would preach nothing other than what was promised in the Law and the Prophets. And just to reference um, one thing Brother Steve had mentioned in his presentation, talking about the Hebraic context and the book of Luke, if you were to open up the book of Luke and you were to find yourself at chapter 2, verse 23, it's a citation of the Old Testament. It's directly paralleling from a verse in the Old Testament. Whatever Luke was preaching to Gentile Christians, again, must be found in the Law and the Prophets. That's the Gospel. There's no, no other Gospel. There's not another Gospel for the Gentile audience. There's not a, another way of interpreting or understanding the Gospel to a Gentile audience. No. We must understand what is found in the Bible the way that the Apostles and Jesus Christ himself said that it must be understood. He did not come to abolish the Law and the Prophets. He came to fulfill them. Again, Romans chapter 15, verse 8, seems very pointed that Christ became a servant to the circumcision, old covenant saints, to confirm the promises given to the forefathers. That's what's found in the Law and the Prophets. And for the Gentiles, because he's going to fulfill what was found in the Law and the Prophets, the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy. In Galatians chapter 1, well, I'm sorry, let me just back up. However, again, the Apostle Paul makes this very clear that he preached nothing other than the Law and the Prophets. And to do otherwise would have been seen as blasphemy in his day. And sure enough, it stands the same in our day. We must be preaching the Gospel that is found in the Law and the Prophets. In Galatians chapter 1, we read the Apostle Paul offering a stern rebuke that sadly we see application for in our day. Even if we, the first century Apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary than that which we already preach to you. Remember, the Apostle Paul established the gospel he was preaching. It was found in the Law and the Prophets. If any man preach otherwise, let him be accursed. Jesus said he came to fulfill the Law and the Prophets in Matthew chapter 5. He made it clear that not one jot or tittle would pass from the law until all is fulfilled. For clarity, jots and tittles are like our periods and commas. So what Jesus Christ is essentially saying to his followers is that not even the smallest detail, not a letter, but even the, the comma or the period in the sentence will not pass from the Law and the Prophets until all is fulfilled. Again, Jesus did not come preaching another gospel. He came preaching the one hope. You find this in Ephesians 4.4. 4, the one hope of Israel. That's the hope of the gospel. In my opening affirmation, I pray that I made it clear that the gospel of Jesus Christ that is detailed in the New Testament is completing what was hoped for in the Old Testament. Jesus is affirming exactly that. He did not come preaching another message, another gospel. Again, to make the point of Romans chapter 15, verse 8, Christ became a servant to the, cir to the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers. The gospel being preached from many pulpits today 
cannot and does not find its place in a historic context of what we find in the Law and the Prophets. Again, most people seem to be rather ignorant of the Law and the Prophets. As Brother Steve had mentioned, that we have all these different views and different things, and I, I believe that it's very clear that the church needs to spend some time in the Old Testament, that we need to begin to understand what the Old Testament is pointing to and hoping for. What is the fulfillment of the promises made to the forefathers? Why are the Gentiles glorifying God for fulfilling what the Old Testament saints hoped for? Matter of fact, what we commonly hear are superficial uses of scripture to establish a completely out of context gospel and sadly, even distortions of the gospel. Any honest survey of Christianity through discussions and books will prove that. Simply ask five Christians to tell you the gospel. Ask five Christians to explain to you the gospel and you will most likely end up with five different responses. You see how that's a problem. There has to be a place where we can find what our gospel is and what we're preaching to the nations. And it's not going to be found just by reading the New Testament. It's going to be found by understanding what is in the New Testament is fulfilling what is found in the Old Testament. Simply visit a bookstore and look at the slew of books talking about rediscovering or finding new perspectives on the gospel or even the details found in scripture. We have a whole lot of confused Christians and many are lamenting this. Futurism as a view of eschatology within the Christian community in its failure to demonstrate a fulfillment of the jots and tittles leads many Christians to lean on their own understanding and become comfortable in their presuppositions. Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. A longing fulfilled is a tree of life. When the futurist view is challenged, it seems that context goes out of the window. Here we already find ourselves discussing the Hebraic context of the gospel, all in an effort to avoid the time statements. Again, for clarity regarding time statements, to borrow a quote from Mr. Douglas Wilkinson in his book on time statements, he said, these are direct and indirect statements found in the New Testament that assert a second coming or what we tonight are referring to as the final coming of Christ that would occur in the first century. Again, I know Brother Stephen has mentioned that the text that we find in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 24, are talking about the ascension of Jesus Christ and the glorification of Jesus Christ. And I agree. I would wholeheartedly agree with him and N.T. Wright. However, what was the point of Jesus being glorified in that generation? It was to bring judgment upon Jerusalem, the end of the age. Again, what I will ask Mr. Whitset and Brother Steve to do tonight is to establish what verses are pointing to this physical final coming of Jesus Christ. And are they different than the verses that we read our Lord talking about in the Gospels? Because I would have a problem with you finding something in another writing by the Apostle Paul that wasn't preached by Jesus Christ. You see, there's a consistency in our Bible. There's a context. The Apostle Paul preached the same gospel Jesus Christ did, and vice versa. So we must find the, the right explanation of what this coming of the Lord was. And I believe, again, I believe I explained that very well to you. Some examples of time statements, again, I, I mentioned in my opening affirmation, Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28, as well as all the soon and at hand references mentioned all throughout your New Testament. A personal favorite of mine that truly highlights the fulfillment of the law and the prophets in the first century is that Daniel was told, to, told not to seal up his writings because the time, I'm sorry, he was told to seal up his writings because the time was far off. I had that in my notes. I need to trust my notes. So he was told that the time was far off, seal up the book, this time is not happening. Well, we know that his prophecies found their fulfillment about 500 years later. And again, that was far off. John, in writing the book of Revelation, was told not to seal his writings because the time was soon, the time was short, which would mean that that would have to be found, the fulfillment of that would have to be found within 500 years. It's about time the futurist view comes to terms with not only what the context of the gospel is, but also the time statements. All too often, before we could even have honest discussion regarding the scriptures, the preterist view is immediately rebuffed and called heresy. Thank God Brother Stephen has not done that this evening. How often the preterist view is excluded from discussion and debates about eschatology. We have, done, we have recently seen this done here on Long Island. All the while, the so-called orthodox views, which are so divided and unclear, cling to a false unity and do harm to the ever-reforming nature of the body of Christ. I have immense amount of respect for Brother Stephen. He's willing to get up here tonight and talk about these details. He's willing to treat us as brothers and sisters and go through this, willingly and diligently allowing his view to be challenged.
Futurism is the leading view within Christianity today. No one can deny that. However, I believe there is sufficient evidence in scripture and with the rampant confusion in our culture that these details must be examined. If not a simple walking worthy of 1 Thessalonians 5.21 to prove all things. Would you imagine that I have been declared a heretic by other Christians, told I'm not allowed to partner with other outreach groups, and even removed from positions in ministry, and I know many others who have suffered even worse ostracism and so forth, simply because we have come to some clarity on what we understand the details of eschatology to be talking about. And sadly, most of the time this is done under the pretenses of me just simply being a heretic and being dismissed, or when we're, we have the privilege of being heard out, we are then dismissed as focusing on a secondary issue. So prayerfully tonight, we are not only covering what the Bible actually says in regards to the end times, but we're also showing that a proper understanding of eschatology is important and is detailed throughout the New Testament. Jesus' teachings, the Apostle Paul's teachings, the Apostle John's teachings, the Apostle James' teachings, everything you find in your New Testament. I know many good-hearted and wise believers, those who I would call my brothers and sisters, that hold to the futurist perspective of Bible prophecy. After all, my mother is a futurist, if we're going to use that phrase. And while I completely disagree with their foundational understanding of what Jesus' teachings were pointing to, and yes, I get a bit dismayed when they seemingly offer false narratives in regards to what the scriptures are pointing to, I do not deny that they are indeed saved by the grace of God, and I love them as my brethren in Christ. However, that does not mean that examination of eschatological views is something to be dismissed or ignored. On the contrary, recently in reading a book about pastoral theology, I came across the following quote, correct understanding can't get us all the way there, but wrong understanding is often all that is needed to shipwreck one's faith. As I believe will be revealed tonight, and of course, I know that if you walk worthy of studying to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the scriptures, the futurist view is not only not found in the Old Testament and offers a new hope, it will also be seen that full preterism does indeed affirm what the scriptures are saying. And it gives us a clear foundation upon which our eschatology stands. After all, that's my story. If I may share some details from my own testimony and transition to the understanding of the preterist view to clarify why the futurist view creates problems with, within the Christian worldview. I came to the faith as a gang member who was well known for my love of reading, especially philosophy and history. The man that led me to Christ in a prison yard was captivated by end times prophecy and the current state of politics, a very common thing. He interpreted the details in the Bible in line with current events, what some call newspaper theology. Giving my life to Christ was amazing and I was desirous to learn the knowledge of God and to lead others not to lean on their own understanding. After all, I, I understood where my understanding had got me. And I still struggle with that to this day. My worldview began to be shaped by the reality that Christ was coming soon, most likely within this generation. Noting all the current events that lined up with my paradigm, how should I live with this new information? It seemed so clear. In Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21, Jesus' advice is rather simple. Flee to the mountains. And boy, was I ready. Learning how to smoke meat had plenty of canned goods, and many of you know of similar groups and mentalities and can almost sense where this was about to lead me. One very powerful antidote that preterism brings to the table is that when we put things into their proper context, we have more of a response to lead people away from the crazy ideas and cults that are rampant in our culture. Context extinguishes false teachings. Thank God for men like Pastor Alan Bondar who challenged me over lunch one day. Time statements and audience relevance. All the details that I have brought before you this evening. And I will continue to bring before you this evening. At that time, I was beginning an internship with the Assemblies of God. Even in the midst of circle, circles I navigated, I was known as the Bible guy. I studied a lot. I street preached. All in line with my convictions that that judgment was coming soon. Fellow Christians and even pastors used my testimony to encourage others. Constantly telling others to study with me that I would be able to provide a response. When I began to study what Pastor Bondar showed me, ready to completely prove this crazy preterist stuff wrong... I realized Pastor Bondar had more context and details on his side than I did. I still have the emails. Matter of fact, I published them in my book, Freaked Out by the New Covenant. Can you guess what happened when I went back to my home church where I was interning and began to ask some questions? From the Bible guy to heretic in moments, 
Can you imagine the effect that had on a young man who turned from gangs to Jesus Christ and now due to studying and studying to show myself approved, walking worthy of the radical Christian that I was encouraged to be, now I was ostracized. I was removed from the assembly. While I'm always open to words of wisdom, correction, even rebuke, I don't believe my areas of gifting are any less valuable to the body of Christ than any others. In offering a negative as to why the futurist view does not enable the body of Christ to walk worthy of the gospel in these current times and why Christians adamantly waiting for a yet future coming, I ask you to consider two things. I've already clarified what the gospel was. That, again, is the biblical narrative. If you don't think these details affect your worldview, I strongly advise you to challenge yourself. We are currently living what has been called the postmodern age, simply because our culture has decided to reject all the wisdom that has gone before us. This is happening in every area of life. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes we could all agree it's a horrible thing. Surely the access to an immense amount of information in our day and age has led to many reforms, and it would be ignorant of us to say otherwise. The futurist view is seemingly blindly supported by many, and when preterism is brought to the table of discussion, it is immediately rejected. As I mentioned in my opening affirmation, this alone exemplifies the failure of the futurist view because it impugns the ever-reforming nature of the body of Christ. We grow by searching, proving, and providing responses to the world around us. Bolstering the futurist view of eschatology is a false unity of the creeds based on contradiction and not necessarily clarifying statements of the church fathers. And a false unity amongst views of premillennialism, amillennialism, mid-trib, and post-millennialism. Yes, they all look to the future. However, when examined, look at the things that they're waiting for and expecting. They're all completely different. So there's no unity in a futurist gospel. Awesome. So we will now begin... Thank you. We will now begin the uh, cross-examination phase. Uh, Pastor Miano, you will begin. You will uh, position questions uh, to Mr. Witsit, and uh, this uh, will last 15 minutes, so at minimum we will have uh, three questions, but uh, I won't tarry any longer. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be asking the question, so you get the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can repeat the question after he asks it, so go to the mic. I'll speak loud enough. I believe they'll hear me. Okay. So, Brother Steve. You had mentioned the quote from N.T. Wright in regards to Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew 16, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Son of Man. And you had mentioned that this is vindication. And as I mentioned in my statement just a minute ago, I, I'm going to ask you to show us some passages that would talk about the second coming of Christ as a physical event that would happen in our yet future. You want me to argue for the physical part of that? Yeah. Or versus the... Uh, the appearing of. Do you understand what I'm what I'm asking? Because we can argue about the physical, but like in the Old Testament, and excuse me for doing this, I want to clarify here. In Exodus 24, 9, I believe it is 9, um, the passage there says the elders got together um, with Moses and they went up on top of the mount and they saw the Lord God of Israel and there was a, like a, a blue floor underneath his feet and they ate and they drank with the God of Israel and they were not killed. So he can appear and he can appear without a physical body. So were we talking about the physical body of, of Christ? Is that what you want to discuss? Are you answering, asking me? Yes, if you can bring me to a verse that would show us that the final return of Jesus Christ is in our yet future. Well that's different than the physical. Well, Okay, then, then give me that first. And then we'll okay. All right. What we understand is in Luke 24, it says that when Jesus appeared to all of those that were in the room, he said to them what? I am not spirit, for I have flesh and bone. Touch me and feel me. He ain't and drank. He was raised in a physical body. When he ascended, it was in the same body. There is no scripture that says he does not long, no longer have a body. Colossians 2.9 In Christ dwells the divine nature in bodily form. Form is sometimes added to that 
in the translation. In the Greek, it just says in bodily. Bodily. Bodily is used only twice. That somaticos is only used twice in scriptures, and it refers to a body. Now, we're talking about not the body of Christ. It says in Christ dwells, lives in a permanent state. And it says dwells in... <laughs> As a present active. It's not something that was in the past or anything else. But currently, as Paul was speaking, he says, in Christ dwells the divine nature in bodily form. So it's stating there that he has a body form. Number second, Next scripture. It talks about um, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Everywhere in scripture that I see body and flesh are... are are the same thing. I have no verse in the Bible that says that a body is not made of anything else but flesh. In 1 Corinthians he says, to each kind its own body, and to every kind of body it has its own flesh. An animal has its own kind of flesh, a bird has its own kind of flesh, and so forth. So, Christ has his own type of a body. Yes, it's a glorious body, but that's a description of what kind of a body. He has a body, and those two verses are the main ones that affirm that. And we have no passage that says that he shed his body, though his body became anything different than that flesh and bone body that was raised in. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, and it offers up what Jesus Christ did in his ministry on earth. Mm -hmm. And then we see him ascend in the cloud, and then we know that he will come back the same way he left. Now, the question I'm going to pose to you comes from 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, because I just want to ask you to explain this verse to me here. It says this, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So, does this text not say that they do not yet know what they will be, but that when he appears, they know they will be made like him? No. 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 Um, I distinctly recall that when you had that discussion with Mr. Bennett in the last debate, I paid it very close attention to that. And Mr. Bennett did not actually address the issue there. And there's two issues that we need to bring up. The first one is, he has not appeared yet. John is saying that Christ has not appeared. He hasn't shown up. We haven't seen him yet. His second coming has not happened yet. But we know when he does appear, we will be like him. And what he's saying there, it hasn't happened yet. But we know that when he will appear, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. So there's two things, two things I want to point out about that. They don't, he hasn't appeared yet. That's all it's saying. It doesn't have anything to do with them not knowing about what he looks like. Because if you remember, John was a witness to the transfiguration. What did he see on that mountain? He had a vision of a glorified Christ who was trans before him. The glory of the Lord shone through him. His clothes turned white. He was changed. The glory of God was revealed. So John would perfectly know what a glorified Christ would look like. And if that's what he looks like and when he appears then what he, John is sitting there saying is that he's going to appear when he comes and we're going to see him. Did they see him in 70 A.D.? Did anybody ever claim that they saw Christ return to earth? Nobody did. Nobody did. Nobody said that it was Jesus himself who descended. So I'm going to read the verse one more time. Mm -hmm. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Mm -hmm. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be made like him, for we shall see him as he is. It, again, I, I just maybe it's my translation. I, I, I think I'm reading the King James here. It says, "It does not yet appear what we shall be, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be." 
It has not appeared what we will be. So what he's saying is, is that he hasn't come yet, so it has not appeared yet what we're going to be. Right. That doesn't mean they don't know. It means it hasn't happened yet. We don't know what it will be. Okay. Um, so talking about flesh and blood, you had said flesh and blood. You know, I said flesh, flesh and body. Flesh and bone. There's a, yeah, there's a difference between flesh and blood and flesh and bone. Okay, I, I thought I heard, heard you say that flesh and body are the same. Oh, the, okay, in that context, yes, yes. So in 1 Corinthians 15, when it tells us that flesh and blood will not inherit, that, that's not talking about my body, right? Is that, is that I'm not able to inherit the kingdom of God right now in a physical body? Is that what that's saying? What, what is that verse talking about? Okay, we know that flesh and blood will not inherit. Okay, what was the point of blood? Blood is the life stream. The Old Testament, they were told not to drink of the blood because the life is in the blood. When Jesus was raised, he said, I am flesh and bone. He didn't say he was flesh and blood. He was flesh and bone. He was raised, changed, immortal and imperishable. And that means he cannot die again. He doesn't need... I don't, I'm not going to sit there and try and explain scientifically what all that means. But what I understand is, is that he becomes immortal. Therefore, his life is in himself, not in his blood. So therefore, flesh and bone, the changed glorified body, the body that's been changed from mortal to immortal, from perishable to imperishable, is what is raised. The body is raised to or changed. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28, Jesus speaking to his disciples tells them that they... Actually, I'm going to read the text for you. Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall reward every man according to his works. And some translations, I believe the NASB would say, coming in his kingdom with his angels, bringing the reward to each of those, again, we see this in Revelation. Now, what I'm asking you is that if this text, you, you've admitted that this text was fulfilled in the first century, that Christ has indeed brought his kingdom to his people, yet everybody in this room has blood flowing through their body. So my question for you would be, if the kingdom of God is not inherited by flesh and blood, is talking about the body of Jesus where it's only flesh and bone, how do we in this room inherit the kingdom? How do we have the kingdom? God, or do we not? Is it possible today in this flesh and blood body to inherit the kingdom of God and to be in the kingdom of God? Okay, there's... Yeah, we're in the kingdom of God now because Christ, the Christ rules in our hearts, does he not? Amen. So we have the kingdom within us. The kingdom is at hand. It's present among us. That's the rule and reign of Christ in men's hearts. But there's also the coming of the kingdom in the form of judgment. When they use that, coming on clouds, when they use that terminology, they're talking about the judgment that comes from the king who sits on their throne. Okay. I, I'm still, you know, I'm going to go back to something I had asked you before. Can you, can you provide me some verses that would bring us to the understanding this future coming? Because again, we, I could point to you all the verses in my Bible mm -hmm. that have soon, have time to <coughs> attached to them. And we would, from what I'm gathering, is we would agree that that coming occurred in 87. But what I'm not finding in my Bible are verses that are pointing to a yet future coming after AD 7. Okay. It has to do with the timing and the nature. The, um, Don Preston basically said that time dictates nature. Well, if I said I was coming at 6 o'clock and I'm wearing a blue suit driving a red car, does it matter if I come at 6 o'clock with a green suit and a purple car? It does, because I said that's when I was going to show up. So if you have a timing statement and the nature, the nature of how he's coming doesn't dictate the time, does it? Just because it's a personal physical coming of Christ, that doesn't mean when it has to happen. Am I losing anybody on that? Because what we're talking about is that the nature of his coming is a physical appearing, where every man sees him. Those who are alive are changed and are made immortal and perishable. And that's within the physical realm as well as the spiritual. Meaning that the person is changed. They've become immortal. Their body. Now, if every Christian 
was made immortal, they'd still be alive. They would never die. If you're made immortal, you don't die. That's what the word literally in the Greek means. Jesus said if we believe in him, we pass from death to life. That's the metaphorical yeah, application of his resurrection. Okay. Um, can you bring me to a passage that would point us to a yet future coming? What, what would be some, be some passages in our Bible that would point us to a yet future coming? Well, all of the passages in the, in the thing are all about a future coming because it hadn't happened yet. See, we're talking about the time period. You're saying it's a future coming. All of the apostles, all of them taught that Christ is coming. He will come. That's all future. So, yeah, you say 70 AD. Okay, looking at the exact uh, of what he said is going to happen, what did happen, and the results of it afterwards. Now, he said three things are going to happen when he comes. The first, it says that he will, in 2 Thessalonians, that when he appears, he will destroy the beast, the antichrist, the lawless one. He will destroy him. Number two, he will raise the dead, and we who are alive are changed. And then we are gathered together with him and rule and reign with him. Then anybody alive would have been changed. They would have known that they've been changed. They would have taught they've been changed. John lived to 98, 100 AD. I know some people disagree with that dating, but the testimony of the early church fathers if you accept the 70 AD that the history records that the Bible never talks about, then you have to look and examine the history that says that John lived beyond there. And even Eusebius recorded, as I said before, that the church and those men, Clopas, who was alive before 70 AD, also was living after 70 AD. And those guys were there in Pella. They were never changed. They later died. So... There's no verses, or actually, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28 is speaking about a yet future coming. Again, I just want to read that verse. It says, mm -hmm. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, We've agreed that that was fulfilled in AD 70, mm -hmm. yet now you just told me that that is something that we're waiting for in our future. How? The coming of the kingdom. The judgment is what was coming. Right. They had the kingdom, the coming of the judgment, then the second coming is a off because it cannot have happened at the same time. So you would disagree with me saying that the apostles and Jesus and John the Baptist were all using an already defined expression, the coming of the Lord. In the Old Testament, that had an expression. Mm -hmm. Again, there's nowhere in the Old Testament that it implied a physical man coming out of the cloud. Well, you're, you're switching things now in here. You're putting in the physical part with the coming. And I'm trying to divide that. The physical is one issue. But his coming in the way that he appears... And that's what I was talking about. When he appears, we will see him as he is. Those people would have seen him. John said, we will see him. John knows what he looks like. John knows who Jesus is. And it says he would have seen him. When John lived in 98, 100, he never saw him. There is no record of any of those men who said, I saw Jesus return. There's nobody who says that they were changed immortal. There was nobody who saw any of the resurrections dead. Yet Matthew mentioned 27 and 15. He saw those people rise up there. But then we don't see any in 70 AD. So we're talking about the nature. All of those things. Okay. Um, yeah. Mr. Wichert, it is now your turn to ask the question. Okay. Uh, I want to make a real quick statement beforehand, uh, before I do. Um, I, I wanted to say this earlier, but I'm going to say it now, and I, I don't care if it's the appropriate time or not, but I've watched Michael from the beginning when he first started on YouTube and everything else, and I want to tell you, I have watched this man grow up and mature, and I have the utmost respect for you, my brother. How much you know? Now, my questions are going to have to do with a little bit of, of logic and, and, and that. And 
I want to bring out just a couple of them in the end so that you can get how I kind of think. Because um, and I, I don't want to carry on too much, but uh, we come from two different perspectives. And, and the, the thing is, is that the predators are divine, uh, d interpreting the scripture through the covenant context. So that means they take passages and put it into that context and then explain that. Am I, I'm correct in that. Okay. And see, then that will always be differences because I understand covenant. I understand how they talked about those things. But I see plain scriptures and plain passages and the logical progression of that and then the theological implications of that. So when I bring up and I'm going to ask you about when he says the redemption of the body, that passage. Um, let me make sure I got the right one. I'll take my time here. Okay, Matthew 8, 23. It says, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. And in Colossians says the, the Spirit is the, the guarantee of our salvation. So we have in the, the Holy Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons. So there's something they're waiting for, the adoption of sons. And the adoption of a son is a legal term back in those days that if I wanted somebody to be my heir, I would write the will out and say, this is going to be my heir. When I die, this person gets everything that I have. So that's the, the adoption process that goes on. And he says... We wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. That's something that's going to happen. The redemption of our bodies. Now, in the Greek there, the redemption, it actually, it actually states, in the literal Greek, the divine adoption of sons awaiting the redemption of the body of us. Is the body going to be redeemed? I believe the body has been redeemed. Michael, take the mic. Uh -oh. oh, thank you. Thanks. Again, in line with the a full preterist view, and I just want to say, uh, if I may qualify something real quickly, um, I don't believe the preterist view is putting things into a covenant context. The way that we would say that is that they were originally given in a covenant context. God was speaking to Israel, giving them a covenant. That what we're reading in the Old Testament wasn't given to all of mankind. It was a, there was a covenant context. And Jesus came to his own, which were the first century Jews. So again, the, the covenant context is established on its own. It's not me making it fit into, my, into a covenant context. Um, in regards to the redemption of the body, um, again, there's a couple passages we could go to. Romans chapter 8, I believe, is what you're alluding to at this point. Yes, and that is the one I'm, I'm talking about specifically. If, if I may just read the text, I find when I read my Bible, I get much more clarity than just thinking about it on my own. So I'm, I'm just going to read here um, Romans chapter 8, verses, let's see, um, I'm just going to read verses 17 to 21. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so, we suffer with him, then we also must be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, again... The body that needed to be redeemed was that old covenant body. And what we're going to see in the book of Romans is that, again, the creation that needed to be redeemed, the word katissus, is, is a term that we, we would need to explore and examine. And the word katissus, for example, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says that the gospel had been preached to all creation. Now, there's nobody in this room, I think, that would say that the gospel had been preached to every Tree, bird, grass, people, nation, etc. 
Again, we understand there's a context to the word creation. So when we figure out what the creation was that was groaning, which again, the creation that was subject to vanity under the old covenant was God's creation, old covenant Israel. When we understand that they were under a death, a curse, because they could not live according to the law of their God, we begin to understand the redemption of that body. And or, if we're going to use the plural term here in Romans, we would understand that the two bodies, all the way going back to Romans chapter 1, if we follow that context up to Romans chapter 8, it's establishing two bodies, Jew and Gentile, that needed to be brought in to Jesus Christ, into one new man. That's mentioned also in the Apostle Paul's writing in the book of Ephesians. So again, the body that needed to be redeemed is not this physical fleshly body, it's the physical fleshly body of Old Covenant Israel. Um, the, uh, the original Greek says re rejection of the body of us. What does that mean, of us? Again, uh, the, the context of the book of Romans. The like Real quickly, I just want to back up and let's establish context on the book of Romans. Um, the book of Romans is written to the church at Rome, right, that was Jew and Gentile, clearly very confused in regards to the things of God. Again, you know, you had the Judaizers in the church, you had Gentiles coming in to Hebraic things, being somewhat confused of those Hebraic things. And what the Apostle Paul is outlining from Romans chapter 1 up until Romans chapter 8 and even further as you go through the book, is he's showing how these two bodies are being formed into one glorious body. He's explaining that through the entire context of the writing. The word body or soma is found in almost every chapter as you move up to Romans chapter 8 because the context again was bringing in the two bodies. So the body of us in this context would be the body of those that were under, that were Abraham's fleshly descendants that we also see outlined in Romans chapter 4. Alright, next question. In, I'll pull it up Philippians 3.21. There we would agree that that's a s s singular use of the word somata. Right? That would be a singular use of the word. No, I'm sorry. Transform our lowly body mm -hmm. to be like his glorious body. When you talked about the days of his flesh, was Christ living in a lowly body that could be killed? Oh. Christ living in the flesh was him living under law. He came in the flesh to his own under, under the old covenant, bound by the law and the prophets. Okay, see, that's covenant application onto it, but I'm asking a specific, direct question. Did Jesus have a lowly body in that his lowly body could suffer and, and had to sleep? He had to do all the things that are normal for a human person, and then he died in that body. Sure. Uh, so but, that was a lowly... Okay, so... The question I guess we would have to... And it's not my turn to ask questions. But, but the question we would have to ask ourselves is that the body that's being talked about in Philippians chapter 3? Um, the lowly body. Again, when we read through Philippians chapter 3, we see very clearly here that the Apostle Paul is saying, I put no confidence in the flesh. He's not talking about this physical... He, didn't, he wasn't saying, I don't put confidence in this physical body. Flesh, that means body. No. What, what he's saying here, if you read through the context, he says, finally, my brethren... I'm going to start at verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, those beware of concision, for we are for we are the circumcision, which the worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, have no confidence in the flesh. Again, this isn't talking about his physical flesh, it's talking about no confidence in the law. Though I may also have confidence in the flesh, if any other thinks that he has he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And then he goes on to mention how he's a, a Pharisee and how he counts all of that as rubbish. The context is talking about the Old Covenant, that under the, in the flesh, under the Old Covenant, the Apostle Paul counted all of that as loss, as nothing, because he wanted to attain Christ and gain Christ, to be found in Jesus, not under the Old Covenant fleshly law, the body of humility, the humble, lowly body. Okay. Uh, let me change directions. And uh, I will say anything more in our conclusions and stuff. Um, when I look at Scripture, obviously when I look at that, I don't apply the covenant idea. I look at the plain, literal meaning. 
I see lowly body, which means he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And he's, he's speaking to Christians, people who say we are a new creation in Christ, but this lowly, lowly body, because in Romans 8, he says, this law of sin and death still works within me. O wretched man that I am, who will save me from such a There is therefore now no condemnation that which are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. So after the flesh, he's talking about the human desires, the human emotions, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That sinful, lowly nature that is controlled by the sin and death. The law that works within the members of our body. And that's what I'm pointing at. In, do you agree that's... Uh, I would agree. Well, first off, plain. Anytime we say plain in um, the plain meaning of the scriptures, we know that the plain meaning of these scriptures have to be to the original audience. I mean, anytime we enter in there, we're, we're gonna. It's not necessarily what's plain to me and you in the 21st century. It's what was plain to them. And again, I, I hope that anybody that picks up the Bible knows that there's a lot of things in there that aren't necessarily plain to us. I mean, you know, coming on the clouds. That's not language we use in the 21st century. Um, so. Again, I, I don't. I, I believe that the problem that we're having is that we're telling two different narratives here. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I'm telling you a narrative that was passed on through Israel. Their covenant was given to them, had blessings and curses, tears, mourning, crying. All of those things were found in that old covenant. And what Jesus comes to do is to change that covenant, to transition the, the saints from the old to the new. So, again, when we're reading all these New Testament writings, we need the plain meaning is only going to be found by understanding what it meant to the original audience. Not, not necessarily, there's nothing plain about it when me and you are trying to find our own interpretation. So, again, I, the body, I think that we're just talking about two different stories. Was Jesus in a lowly human body? Sure, I believe Jesus came as a man. He was in a regular body. However, what the scriptures are talking about is the context of the body that he came as a Jew. That he came in that old covenant. He came to his own, and he was redeeming them from the law of sin and death. That body of death the Apostle Paul talks about okay. a couple of chapters before, Romans 7. All right, now a simple question of just logic that I want to ask about. And this is something that I'm just using as a springboard for people to think. It's uh, Revelations 19, or excuse me, 20, verse 4. And, and basically it's verse 4. It says, Then I saw thrones, and seated them them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Now, I've talked about this a little bit before. This is a scene that's in heaven, correct? Amen. We agree on that. Then I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. They were killed in the tribulation, correct? Yeah. Okay. And those who had not worshipped the beast of the image and not received his part of the forehead, they came to life. How do people that are beheaded in Christ, they've already been changed, they're a new creation, they've died, they're standing before the throne of God. In, in Revelation 6, you know, glory and hallelujah, and they're singing praises to the Lord. How long, Lord, do we have to wait? They've been beheaded, they're in Christ, they're standing before the throne. How do they come to life? And I would add in there the rest part of that situation, uh, the last part of that verse. Five, it says, this is the first resurrection. So how do they come to life? If they have been dead? So I imagine this is, this is kind of baiting me into they have to have a body, right? That's what we're, we're kind of saying here is that in order for them to come to life... I'm they actually would... asking you what you will say. Okay. Um, again, the, the, the Hebrew people, they had a conceptual reality. When we talk about the resurrection of the dead, right? When we talk about what did it mean to be gathered to the fathers? Now, I, I don't believe that the Bible is telling you what that reality essentially looked like. The Jews would have understood that, that, well, he's gathered to the fathers. He's waiting in Sheol for the day of judgment. Again, I, I don't believe our Bible is trying to explain to us how they were made alive. Again, they were made alive, which is the power, you know, the power of the gospel. They were made alive. They were going to be judged. They were going to face all of these details. And again, I think the context of the book of Revelation shows us that this had to have already been fulfilled. So, again, how did they come to life? Again, it's a conceptual reality. It it's not something I necessarily have to define, or I don't believe Scripture is necessarily defining it. But they both, okay. But he says it was the first resurrection, so, okay, here's the answer. All right. Um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and leave it at that. If I may, do you mind if I qualify what I said? No, no. One thing I'll say is this, that how did they come to life? The first resurrection are those that put their faith in Jesus Christ. They went from death to life. The second resurrection that we're reading about here would be the resurrection of the dead ones, the dead. That they were, again, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40 says that the saints in the New Testament would not receive their perfection or their hope until those of the Old Covenant were brought together with them. Again, we see that in 1 Thessalonians 4, that the dead in Christ will rise first, then all of those details that we see there. So, uh, again, it was a very conceptual reality, but the way that the first resurrection even happened was that men put their faith in Jesus Christ in the physical, in a lot, being alive, put their faith in Jesus Christ in that ministry and went from death to life. Well, John 5, 27, 4, 28 says that there will be a resurrection of the unjust. So how are the unjust resurrected? Because they're not resurrected in Christ. They're not raised in Christ. So how are they resurrected? May I answer that? Yes. All right. Um, By the buzzer. Again, what we are understanding is that is a citation of Daniel 12, right? We understand in Daniel 12, the hope, well, the hope of Israel was that there would be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So how did that happen? Again, um, you know, that there would be difference in our understanding of how that happened. I would demonstrate a conceptual reality that if, you know, we were to look at the resurrection of the dead, that how they understood that. They understood that you were gathered to the fathers and that one day which I don't believe scripture to be pointing out or explaining how that was going to look. And I, I believe that's way beyond anybody in this room or my, I'll admit me personally, it's beyond my understanding of how that would occur. So I don't believe John's vision needs to be explained in this physical, concrete, dare I say, Greek way. I, I don't believe that's the nature of the book of Revelation. It was a vision given to people who were understanding the soon coming of the Lord and giving them clarity in regards to how that would be consummated. So I, I don't think that... Scriptures even attempt to explain that. We will now break for 10 minutes. Uh, I know many of you have received a piece of paper in which uh, you can write a question. Now, I will ask you to do this. Please write the name of the individual that you would like to ask the question specifically. Now, both participants will have an opportunity to... Um, within the next uh, 20 minutes uh, to uh, come in three, uh, three times we agreed upon, correct? Yeah. Three times uh, to go ahead and answer that. But in the essence of time, if you can direct your question specifically at one of our participants, and we'll come back in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. I just got done saying that, you know, out of all the uh, 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 debates that I've been a part of, this is definitely going to be one of my favorites. Thank you. All right, all right. All right, so as you know, we've, uh, we've been moving along here and um, sticking to protocol, making our own rules every once in a while, right? Being a little flexible, that's okay. I'll wait for everybody to sit down. So we've got, uh, we've got a good bit of questions here, and uh, we're going to move uh, rather quickly. So uh, what we'll do? is um, I've separated them uh, uh, in between uh, both participants. So I'll ask one question to uh, Pastor Mike, and then one pet, uh, question to uh, Mr. Witsit. And uh, what we'll probably do, because it's a little bit lopsided, is uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll continue down the questions and probably allow both participants to, uh, to chime in. So. Without further ado, we better start with him first since there's more. Are we ready? <laughs> we, we said this was going to happen, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So we will start with Pastor Miano. And Pastor Miano, would you please explain 1 Thessalonians 4 17? Verse 17, I'm just going to read the text first and then I'll explain it. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, when we open up this text, what we have is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he's telling them about this, this blessed hope that they have. Now, 
real quickly just to uh, kind of bring in some context here in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 he's telling them that he wants them to walk according to the commandments and then he wants them to have hope I do not want you to be ignorant brethren verse 13 concerning them which are asleep again when you, you die in Christ you don't die you can't die you sleep it's a, you know, a euphemism for the death of the saints it's not everybody it's the death of the saints the saints those that had life in Christ would sleep the dead ones are a different topic. So now, the, here it's saying that do not want you to have no hope concerning them that are asleep, them that have died in Jesus Christ. For if we believe that Christ died and rose again, even so, those who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain, which again, that simply points out that the Apostle Paul believed that there were some within his generation, his time, who were alive and remained, that again, he believed that that was going to happen in that time, those people alive right there, that they would be caught together. Again, the Greek term used there is harpazo. It does not mean up. It has no direction. Unfortunately, our Bibles are translated with the word up. You know, you shall be caught up. That's not the context. Caught together, gathered together, harpazo, to in the body of Christ. Again, and comfort one another with these words. So what was happening in that first century and what happened in AD 70 was that when Christ came, not only was judgment brought upon Old Covenant Jerusalem, but the living saints were transformed, meaning they were given a boldness that now that Old Covenant was no longer a problem. The Judaizers would no longer be a problem. They were changed. Again, I would exhort everybody to do a word study on the word change that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as well as 1 Thessalonians 4. You'll find that there's a boldness attached to that change, that they would be transformed in a way that would give them a boldness to proclaim the message. When they saw the dissolution of that Old Covenant, trust me, the coming of the Lord they were given a change. They were given a boldness. And then the dead, those that were asleep in Christ, would be raised up, would be gathered together with them in that reward. John chapter 14, Jesus said, Fear not, for I will come to bring you where I am. That was the hope of the saints, that they would be in the presence of God. And what you're seeing in 1 Thessalonians 4, which again was fulfilled in the first century, this is not a text pointing to a yet future reality, this is saying that those saints in that first century were caught together, the living and the dead, whether they were living saints that believed in Jesus Christ, they were asleep saints in Jesus Christ, the, the dead that believed in Jesus, and then the dead ones, which this text isn't speaking about, 1 Corinthians 15 is, the dead ones were even gathered into this glorious gathering together, the harpazo of God's people. Again, that's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about. That's how we encourage one another, that those that were dying in Christ, they had a hope. They would be brought together with the living when the coming of the Lord happened. Thank you. You, you can applaud. So I, I saw another question in here, and I'm, I'm sure uh, we're dancing on it for some folks. Um, Mr. Witsit, what is your explanation of the rapture? Caught up like a fishnet that's been gathered the fish together. That's the idea that's implied. It's not necessarily, like he said, an upward motion, but it means to be caught up and snatched up. And it's a term that's actually used for, uh, like what a thief, when he steals, is where that root comes from, and he's snatched up. And so the idea is, is that at his coming, we who are alive will be changed. Those that are dead will rise up out of the graves. Both groups will come together and caught up. Now, Don Preston, in his book, he mentions and he talks about the idea of uh, the word meet and apantesis. It's the idea of that we meet him in the air. Now, he explains it in the way of, of in the old Roman world, when, they, when the king would come into the country or the, the commander of the, after an army in a battle would come into a city, they would send heralds in front of them and say, hey, we're coming. The city would pour out and they would line it up and they would have a parade and they would parade the captives with them and they would go into the city. This is the exact same thing that we saw on Palm Sunday. Word went forth that the king is coming, they gathered outside, they gathered around and then he came into the city with them singing the praises. That's the exact same picture. This is the exact same picture that Paul is presenting. Is that he gathers them all together, we meet him as he's coming here to earth to establish that kingdom on earth. We meet him in the air. We meet with him. He's on his way going from one place to another. 
to use my. Uh, well, you actually don't have to because there was one, the exact same question directed right at you. So, right at you. <laughs> this is almost the same question as I just answered, right? First Thessalonians 4, the rapture? Fair okay. Close. So, um, Brother Steve, beautiful explanation. Again, um, I totally forgot about the bringing in of apontesis. And um, again, the meeting of that king, you know, again, that's what we're talking about here. The meeting of God's people being gathered together with their king in the air. Now, the term here used for air is not the term for sky. Again, there's two different Greek words. Um, one Greek word would be oranos, and the Greek word that is used here, oranos, would be sky. The Greek term used here is uh, not coming to me right now. However, what I would tell you is um, that that Greek term, not a Greek scholar here. It's sorry? Air. air. Right, yes. That term does not mean sky. It does not mean up in the clouds. That term is actually symbolic with the space here, the breath, the air surrounding us. So again, what we're talking about here is not being caught up into some sky with Jesus as he comes out of the sky. We're talking about the gathering together of God's people in the spirit of God. And again, this was fulfilled in the first century. And real quickly, just to qualify that, the Apostle Paul says, for we who remain, if I said to each and every one of you, if we, when we are alive, or those of us who remain, you would say, oh, some of us will be there. Some of us will be there for that event. This already occurred. The rapture fulfilled, whatever this gathering together. Again, there are a couple divisions in the room. And uh, again, even noting the division, we know that this had to find its fulfillment in the first century. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Whitson, what do you believe this gathering is talking about in regards to Matthew 24, verse 31? What do you believe this gathering is talking about? Is it talking about real angels gathering real elect, individual saints? According to Matthew 24, 29, this gathering was supposed to occur immediately after the tribulation. In context of Matthew 24, that tribulation was the persecution of, uh, in, excuse me, 62 to 66 A.D. Uh, what happened in... Uh, Mr. Wilson. Third, please stop. Well, okay. All right. Um, I'll just tell you. The gathering together. Um, what's recorded in history by Eusebius is, that, and I think I mentioned this before, in his Church History Book 3, they were warned in Matthew 24, wasn't it, to flee. Why? Okay, the flee. There's your gathering. There is the warning that it's time to flee. And where did they gather? They gathered together in Pella. That would not be in the air. That was there. So if Paul is talking about meeting in the air, that he snatches them up. They don't have to flee. He didn't say flee. He said, I'm going to gather them up, snatch them up. There's two different things. It's two different concepts. So we have to understand that that's one of those things that signify that there's two different things going on here. So they gathered in Pella. The church lived and survived. Nobody was taken up. Nobody said that, that we were changed. Nobody said that we saw the resurrection of the dead. Nobody was made immortal. So that's what distinguishes um, Matthew 24 and talking about the gathering versus what Paul says that we are snatched up. We are caught out of this place as if snatched out of the fire. It's kind of the same symbol, the same principle that uh, he uses in that, in that regard. Okay. Pastor Miano, it is well described the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. It is also well we were doing good on handwriting. We were, it, it is also well um, stated, I'm sorry, uh, that the first century Christians were told and understood th that Jesus would be coming soon. If it was so well described, his first appearances, and was so expected, wouldn't there be scriptural descriptions of Jesus' appearance in A.D. 70? Okay. Okay. Well, Jesus, he, he physically came as a man. We, we all would agree there, right? He came into this world. He had a physical body as a regular man, lived like us, 
Acts chapter 1 tells us that he was caught up into the clouds and then taken into heaven and that he would come in the same way that he was taken into heaven. Again, hidden by a cloud. If you read Acts chapter 1, I'm going to take you there in a little while. So, again, we, we see very clearly that that coming was to be coming in the clouds. It was the coming of the, the Lord that was defined in the Old Testament. So now, in regards to what happened in A.D. 70, again, there's quite a few details that we see fulfilled in that first century period. Josephus, a Jewish scholar, not even a Christian scholar, um, notes, or Jewish historian, he notes that there was all kinds of calamitous events in the sky, in the clouds, that happened during that time. He notes that the um, there was a or I believe there's another church father that would um, quote that on the Mount of Olives there was a cloud that was re residing above the Mount of Olives during that time from AD 66 to 70 AD. So again, there's clear actually, there's just to sum up that last part, if it was so well described, his first appearance, and was so expected, wouldn't be there any scriptural definition of Jesus' appearance in AD 70? There is. The coming of the Lord was, the, again, it's very clearly defined throughout the Old Testament as war, as judgment, as Brother Stephen and, as I, and I have admitted tonight. We both see that very clearly, that a coming of the Lord is defined. So in AD 70, history records it. Again, it's not in your Bible because your Bible was written prior and fulfilled pri or written prior to AD 70. So these events would not be described in your Bible. However, we find Jewish historians, we find church fathers, uh, just to respond to something um, Brother Stephen had just said in regards to the church fathers. The church fathers are not unanimous in regards to immortality, um, what they have, what they don't have. Um, again, if you do a good study on church history, you'll see that there's some church fathers that say they're glorified. There's some church fathers that are still waiting for a glorification. There's some church fathers that believe they're in the new heavens and new earth. There's some that don't. There's some that believe the coming of the Lord occurred. There's some that don't. Again, there's not a unanimous record in church history to say that these things did or did not occur. But I will say this, and I'll just summarize it this way. There's plenty of description in history outside that shows the coming of the Lord that Jesus said was going to happen. Because that's what we're talking about here, Jesus' words. He said it was going to happen in that generation. And all the signs that happened due to history that we can study out and find, they're there. It, it's actually very well described throughout history. It's just going to take a little bit of legwork on our part. Thank you. Can I ask something real Please. quick? So you're, you're associating when he said, this same Jesus that you saw go in will return. You're associating the clouds and all of that as Jesus returning. If I may just read you the text I'm using. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's not a matter of what I'm asserting. It's, I'll just read you Acts chapter 1. Right. It, it seems to be pretty clear there. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It says, And when he had spoken these things, they beheld he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly at the, toward the heavens as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. And said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And the, again, Romans chapter 9. And he, was, and he had spoken these things, they beheld, he was taken up, a cloud received him out of their sight. And then they looked and he went into heaven from that cloud. So he was going, yes, absolutely, he was going to come in the same way he went into heaven. Not the same way he went into the cloud. He was going to come in the same way he went into heaven, which was hidden in a cloud. Mr. Winsett, how many judgments are there spoken of since Christ began his ministry? You have said that there are at least two. Correct. There's an initial... Judgment on 70 AD because that fulfilled the days of vengeance were all fulfilled. Everything that Christ prophesied was about the destruction of 70 AD and Jerusalem. Now, I'm one of those people that believe that Revelation was written after 70 AD. And I have many arguments for that. But the, so that would place the second judgment of all men, the great white throne, at a future time period where all men who have ever lived will stand before him and be judged according to what deeds they have done. So I see two judgments. That one there of just Jerusalem and the other um, and it's the second Peter uh, quotation that I'm thinking of is that it said um, just like Noah's, the world of Noah, the world of the ungodly in Noah's day was destroyed 
The passage says, by the same command, by the same word of judgment, this present earth that now exists is being stored up, not for water, but for fire, for the world of the destruction of the world of the ungodly. That means then the Christians are saved and the world is destroyed. The 70 AD was about the Jewish destruction of them and their system, not the world of the ungodly. Pastor Miano? Continue? Yeah, please. Okay. What book talks about Jerusalem after destruction in 70 AD and how they lived? If any book was written after 70, wouldn't that be written? Uh, wouldn't, if, if any book was written after 70, 70 AD, wouldn't that be written? Example, if someone wrote about history in our country and September 11th was not in the book, wouldn't we gather that book that, that was written before September 11th, 2001? Sorry, I'm just going to read the question and uh, then I'll give an explanation. There are no books in the Bible that speak about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, being that I would posit that every book in the Bible was written prior to AD 70. Again, um, all mostly written by latest, maybe AD 63. Um, we find the latest Christian writing in the New Testament. Um, so no, no book in our Bible would be positing that history. However, again, Josephus, first century Jewish historian, notes all of these details. Eusebius, church historian from the third century, he notes all of these details that the church fled to Pella, listened to the, their Messiah, and fled to Pella. If any book was written after AD 70, wouldn't that be written, and yes, you're absolutely right, it would have the details of if the book of Revelation, for example, as Brother Stephen here is positing, if it is written after AD 70, then it should be telling us something about the destruction of Jerusalem, something that would have been very important to the audience at that time. So again, the reason why we don't have this history is that our Bible was fully, the, the writings you have in your Bible were written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. So there's not going to be any history found in your Bible. However, again, I exhort all of you, be diligent. Search out the history, and I'll promise you, you'll find the details. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and combine two questions since they're very similar. If his physical coming, uh, uh, were, if his coming is physical, where everyone can see him, how can everyone, whether in Australia, Hawaii, or Canada, this one asked about the space station, um, International Space Station, or if someone was on a mission on the moon, would be able to see him. Um, this one in particular asks, I know, well says, I know God can work all things out, but that's not an honest answer. So if someone is on a mission on the moon, will those eyes see him? What part of the question? Um, how will everyone see him at the same moment? And let's see if I can put this together then. How can that limited body be seen by everyone and everywhere, everyone at the same time? Good question. You know, the Bible does not address that answer one way or the other. But it says that every eye will see him. So, lightning, I, I'm just throwing this out there. I'm just throwing one thing out there. As lightning flashes from east to the west, something that's in the sky, I'm saying that there's something about what happens when that this glorious display happens that everybody will see it. I don't know if he, if he comes and he circles the earth. I'm joking. But... We don't know. We just don't know. But it says that they will see him. Now, could that be just limited to everybody that's in the area? That could be very true. It could be just those that lived in that area. But actually right now, I think it was John Hagee's ministry that actually did it, or one of those guys. They put a camera up on the temple over there that overlooks the Mount of Olives. So just by chance he comes back tomorrow, that camera will catch the whole thing, and everybody will be seeing it on YouTube and everything else. But... What about the moon? Well, I, I, we don't know, do we? We don't know. If now, if he was a Christian, what would happen to him? He would be gathered together with him. He's already up there on the moon. Gathered with the Lord. The Lord's not on the moon. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now we're at a point where the rest are for Ms. Mr. Whitson. Oh. So, <laughs> so I'll defer to the participants. Uh, I'll direct and, them to you. Go and, ahead. Yeah, and he can answer if he wants to. <coughs> his mind if he wants to. Sounds good. And, and we'll move along here. So, if not one jot or tittle may be removed from the law until all has been fulfilled, and since the futurist understanding is a future fulfillment, then aren't they still under the law and all of it? Okay. The law was used in wording in three different ways. One, it was talking about the statute, the rules, and the regulations. And we talked about that. The law also included um, everything that was written about the law in the prophets and the Old Testament, right? All of that. But it was also used very specifically to just be a, a term, a covenantal term, if you would say, about the whole law. Now, that law, the covenant, was a contract between God and his people. And some of the main tenets it was is that if you do not obey, what will happen to you? You die. Okay, the New Testament. For all is sinned and falls short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Christ paid the price for all people. He was the only one that was righteous. He came down. He paid the penalty for everybody who lived from Adam on up to that point. He died for all of us. So if he paid the price for all everybody then he fulfilled the contract the contract says if you don't do what's right you die he died in place of everybody else therefore the contract the new covenant or the old covenant ended and he said what I write a new covenant in my blood so the new covenant was written so simply how was Paul and Peter saved under the terms of the new covenant not by the blood of bulls. So the old covenant had died on the cross. The new one was written. The new one is enforced. But the outward symbols of that dead and dying Jewish system was destroyed completely. The outward physicals. And we could compare that with what Paul said. Let no man judge you about your Sabbath days or your feasts that you keep because those were all shadows. They were all fulfilled in Christ and the cross. So all of those things ended except for that. How do we know it ended on the cross? The veil was torn in two. The, the price had been paid. It was accepted. He came out. And now he can live with man. In talking about Matthew chapter 5, about the, the jots and tittles of the law and the prophets, I, I just want to read you a text, the words of Jesus. He said, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoso shall do them and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So again, there's jots and tittles of the old covenant can't pass away until they're fulfilled. We, we can't do away with that. And one of the things I've brought before you this evening that I hope you will really consider is that what we're reading about is Romans chapter 15, verse 8. We're reading about the promises that were given to the forefathers in the law and the prophets. So again, this isn't a reality that was given to all men. You see, that, that I believe that that's how we end up running into universalism, is when we begin to say that it happened for all of us. No, Jesus died for his people. He was a sacrifice for his people. And his people in the primary context, in this context here, were primarily the Jews of the house of Israel and the Gentiles that were being grafted into that covenant. The Gentiles didn't have to go by the law. In Acts chapter 15, we see the council at Jerusalem decided the eight things that the Gentiles needed to follow leading up to AD 70. However, the Jews were bound by law until all details were fulfilled. And when we put everything on the cross, what we end up doing is we lessen the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We lessen the importance of the ascension, which we've agreed about the coming of the Lord in Matthew chapter 24. And we lessen the importance, which the Apostle Paul places great emphasis on, the resurrection of the dead. 
You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul basically points out that if you don't believe there's a resurrection of the dead, which, again, that's the crux of the gospel, that the dead ones were going to be received into this glorious new covenant. If we're saying that it all ended at the cross and that everything was put on that cross with no need for the rest of the details, we're taking away from the context of Scripture. And also, mind you, that what we're reading about in the book of Hebrews, the details, the fulfillment of all of these details, is showing you the, how atonement was fulfilled. Yes, a high priest would offer a sacrifice, but that's not where it ended. The high priest would offer a sacrifice and he would have to come out to his people and say, this has been received. You are now glorious. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 tells you that he will appear a second time to bring salvation to his people. That was not at the cross. That's in AD 70 when the Lord came in the clouds, the coming of the Lord, to bring judgment upon that wicked generation and make clear the manifestation of the sons of God, those who trust in Jesus Christ. I believe the context is very clear that we need the details all fulfilled. Can't all be at the cross. Can I, can I point something out? You Please. said, just now, you said he had to come out, right? He had to come out. The veil was torn in two. The presence of God is no longer there. It is out. Go on. Amen. Okay. Well, the veil was torn in two after his resurrection. All right. After his death. Same time as death. Go on. You speak of all things being restored physically one day back to the state of the garden. You say we, will, you say we still suffer sickness and we still age. Is that because of sin? If so, while Jesus was on earth, he aged as well, yet he was without sin, correct? How do you explain this according to your reasoning? The, war, the, this, the operation of sin and death works in the body. The body was under the curse. That is where this, the, um, the effects of that sin and death that came into the world. He became in as a man and fully man. So yeah, he did not sin, but that body that he had was a lowly body. It was not a glorified body. It was not a resurrected body. Um, it was a, considered a lowly body. He, he wept. He hungered. He thirsted. He was subject to all of those things in the same way in the cycle like this. And the Bible says that he came as a man in order to what? Experience death for all of us and, the, and, and experience life for us so that when he died... He would die for all of that and, and to take care of all of that. Um, last part of that question again. Is there something real quick? Nope. It was how do you explain this according to your reasoning? Okay. Did I make that clear then? Uh, yeah. Okay. You covered how did he age without sin? Huh? How did he age without sin? Oh, yeah, that was the point. That was, that was the thing. It's not sin that aged you. It was the curse that was on the human body from the garden that was placed on it. He became made lower than the angels that he suffered with us in the same way. So that body of his was subject to the same things and the same principles. So some of you put about three questions on here, so being a little sneaky. I will say that your handwriting is infinitely better than last year. I know we had somebody here from Thailand this year. Last year we definitely had some Egyptians here because there was some hieroglyphics on it. All right. So <laughs> we commonly hear futurists say we will get a new body when we die, a glorified body like Jesus. How then do you explain Jesus' disciples seeing Jesus return with pierced wounds in his hands, etc.? He didn't have a new body at all, so where do we get this idea that our body will be a new physical body after death? Uh, what do the scars represent? His death for us? Are those a terrible thing? Are they a disgusting thing? I got scars all over my arm. I'd be glad to get rid of those. You know, somebody who is in a wheelchair paralyzed, I would they're not going to be in the same form, are they? They're going to be completely healed and all of that. And I think Christ's body, that demonstration was the proof of what I he did for us. And I think that's a reminder to us of what he did, the price that he paid for us. So that doesn't mean that those scars on him are something terrible to be looked at and, and to think, oh, it's a reminder for us. Are you okay with continuing? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
You touch on a thousand year kingdom, please explain. That view and exp ex please explain that view and explain how he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Means all of them. Psalms 50, 10, uh, uh, verse in Revelation 24, we find a kingdom of only 1,000 years. Keep in mind that there are many thousands in our Bible. For me? Yes. Okay. Revelation also talks about three and a half years. Was that going to be a little three and a half years? Yeah. In other words, the Bible does use it metaphorically, and they do use it literally. Because also in Revelation, it, say, it says that 7,000 men are killed during the earthquake in uh, Revelation 11, where the two witnesses are, 7,000 people. So I know the Bible knows how to use specific language and for that. It's awesome. It's off, uh, often assume that it's just talking about a metaphorical time period. But when I look at Revelations, and we talked about that a little bit before, it starts off with the beheading of the saints. They are raised. They rule with him for that thousand years. At the end of that reign, then the rest of the unjust and the others are raised. So that's going to be a specific time period. Is it exactly a thousand years to the day? I don't know. I'm not going to sit there and say it's a, I demand that it's a thousand years exactly. But I know that it can't start until after Christ returns. And I know that during that time that uh, Satan is bound in a pit with the chains. He's not allowed to deceive the nations. So that time period is telling me that Satan is not running around <coughs> deceiving the nations. Those are the things that mark that as a specific time period. So I know it's going to begin at Christ's return. And it's going to end with Satan being released, gathering a second army, and attacking Jerusalem. And that's when fire comes down. The world of the ungodly is destroyed. And we all, whoever live, will go up into heaven um, and face the, the great white throne judgment. On Brother Stephen's website, I, I had the privilege of downloading a bunch of articles and reading through a lot of resources. And I just want to take a borrow a quote from N.T. Wright that you have on your website. And it, just going to take a piece of it. It says, nobody takes all the Bible literally yep. and nobody takes it all metaphorically. Whatever they may say, we are none of us as wooden as our slogan suggests. In order to interpret any passage, particularly any passage of apocalyptic, the way of wisdom is to go through it one step at a time, deciding what is literal and what is metaphorical on the way. Again, that's N.T. Wright quoted on your website. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about plain reading of scripture tonight. And if you were a first century Jew, and you had read, you're very familiar with your Old Testament, and you've read this term thousand used again and again and again, you know, a thousand will fall at your left hand and 10,000 at your right hand. You've seen this used so often as a metaphoric phrase for a, a complete amount. Again, the, the cattle on a thousand hills that we find in the book of Psalms. Um, we see this term used very categorically as a number of completion, a time of completion, never to be necessarily intended to be literal. Again, the three and a half years, if we were to read through the text, I believe that becomes clear because when you're reading the text, you see three and a half years was never used. Again, it wouldn't have been plain language to a Jew. And what about the 7,000 that died? Well, again, the way that Hebrew gematria would work, see, 7,000 could get a bit interesting because we have the number seven, meaning, again, another, another number of completeness or holy, and then you have that coupled with thousand. So, Again, there could be a meaning there, or it could be a literal 7,000 people. Right. Uh, that However, in Revelation chapter 20, the details that we're reading there about a thousand year reign, I believe it becomes very clear when we read through the text that it's talking about a time of completion. Again, Revelation 20 almost sums up the gospel, where it's all the details that Christ came into the world to destroy the works of the devil, and we see that happening in Revelation chapter 20. It's essentially the essence of the gospel that would be fulfilled within a completed, again, thousand, a completed amount of period of time. And I believe that's what's being reiterated for you in Revelation chapter 20, rather than a literal thousand-year reign or any of those details. Thank you. I'm going to allow a little bend here, and I'm going to go with the second question that, that, that's uh, actually on here. Now, you say that we must see Christ in the same manner as he left. Luke 21, 27. Matthew 26, 64. He'd be coming in a cloud in power. God appears in the clouds many times. Uh, Psalm 68, 4. Psalm 104, 3. Why can't Christ appear in clouds 
in the same way. Uh, I wish I had it over there. He will appear a second time to bring salvation. He will appear a second time. When did he appear the first time? When he came and was born as a baby, he lived and he died. He appeared to people. He will appear a second time to bring salvation at his second coming. So we're saved? Yeah, we're saved. All right, I'll explain it. I'll explain the imagery this way. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Imagine that we're born into a pit, like quicksand. We're there in it. Christ is standing outside. He throws us the rope of the Holy Spirit. We've got a hold of that Holy Spirit. We've got a hold of that rope. He's going to bring us out of the pit. He's saving us from out of the pit. We're still in the pit until we're pulled out. Correct. I'm going to uh, just interject here and ask that the audience uh, not interact. Oh, That's what okay. the papers are for. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll finish it up then just for you. The idea is simply is this. It's the already not yet. I've already discussed it with him um, a little bit. But it says that we have redemption and then we're waiting for the day of redemption. We are saved. We are accounted as saved. We have been in Christ. We trust that word. We are saved. But... Have I died yet? Got the new body? Am I in heaven? No, I'm still going through this process of living this out, this life in this body of sin and death that is lowly, it falling apart, it's getting older and everything else. And so when, I, when he comes and this body is transformed, or when I die and I'm standing up before him, that's my day of redemption. That's when everything is fully completed. Pastor Miana, continue. All right. Which verse mentions lowly body? The one we just... And I know we might be overlapping here a bit. If you feel okay. like you've answered it, then yeah. we can I mean, move on. Make sure Philippians 3. 21. Yeah, Philippians 3.21. My, uh, I don't think to, think to I, I, I suffer from dyslexia. So numbers with me get real bad. You can sit there and look at me and I'll tell you, Philippians 3.21, I'll write down 3.12. So I have to sometimes really just look at it. But yes, 3.21. He will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. So there's a one-to-one -one correlation. If we have a lowly body, it's going to be changed to become like His glorious body. Then He has a glorious body and we're going to become like Him. Immortal and imperishable. The body of Christ in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, uh, 12 and 13. Is this a body of flesh? If so, how so? 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about the body of Christ. That word soma is used literally as a body in many scriptures. It's talking about the body that we live in, this lowly body that we live in. But it is also used metaphorically as the body of Christ. Instead of saying the body of Christ all the time, he would put and he would abbreviate it down to just body. So in 1 Corinthians 12, isn't he not talking about that we are the body of Christ? We are many members of that body. So is that something that's kind of a spiritual principle that there's many of us, but we are all one and made of one body? Mr. Mike. Okay. Revelations 22, 11. Righteous still being righteous. Um, I think 50 still being 50, is it? Holy still uh, be holy in the new heaven and new earth. You said there is no sickness, no tears in the new heaven and new earth. Correct? Correct. Correct. That's the question. Oh, okay. Basically, uh, we look at that passage and one of the key things in there, it says we will see him face to face. And that is always... That, that actually comes back from the Old Testament when, when God and Moses, they saw each other face to face. And God said, he is the only man I saw face to face. And what is he talking about? Did he, Moses see God in the bush? Did he talk to him in the tabernacle when God came down in the, in, the, in the clouds and things? He saw them face to face. There's that, that, imp, that talking about. But when we get into heaven... And we're there, do we see God face to face? 
Do we look upon his face? Can he look upon our face? He says, Behold, I make all things new. All the former things have passed away. The relationship is restored with God. We now see him face to face. Why would in the new Jerusalem, in heaven, that comes down out of heaven into a new earth, why would we have sickness when he's defeated that? Why should we have um, diseases or any of the things that have, are part of the curse? Because he says, I will restore all things. So if he restores all things in the new heavens and the new earth, that new Jerusalem come down is a representation of that idea actually here on earth. And what I talked about in the physical creation that's redeemed. It's really important that we see the book of Revelation as a covenantal book. When we begin to understand the details that are happening at the end of the book of Revelation, um, for example, I, I've given you a handout for my opening statement um, this, this evening, and if you look at the bottom of that opening statement, I'll sh I show you the tears, the mourning, the crying, the pain, the sorrow, that's all outlined for you in the Old Testament that characterize the Old Covenant. Again, the Old Order is not what we're living in. It's not this reality. This is the new order. Be grateful. You're in the body of Christ. You, you are saved. That salvation has been revealed. Again, the, what is happening in the end of Revelation is that that old order was passing away. That old covenant was passing away. The people that had been burdened by that old covenant, again, I believe one of the issues we're having here is not understanding necessarily the lowly estate of God's people under that old covenant. Again, it's not talking about my physical state. You see, in Luke chapter 1, when Mary's praying, it talks about her, that God had looked upon her lowly estate, her, her you know, body of humiliation. She was in the body of humiliation, the body of death. It's the old covenant. That's what it's talking about. Again, you see it in James chapter 1, verse 10, this low estate used. And it's not talking about the physical flesh. It's not talking about our bodies and our experience in the flesh. It's talking about the, the economy or the position that you're living in. That I believe it was Mr. Stevens today that talked a bit about the positioning, that the aeon, the age, wasn't only a period of time, but it was also a position. And I believe that's important for us to understand, that when we're talking about going into the new age, that the old order, the old age passed away, we're talking about our position, our covenant with God. It, it, this isn't about you leaving this reality, this physical reality, to go to some other reality. And if I may just simply qualify one last point, the new Jerusalem isn't heaven that you're going to go to. The New Jerusalem is outlined in Galatians chapter 4 very clearly to be the New Covenant. You see, the New Covenant is the New Jerusalem that came out of heaven from God, has been given to God's people. And that is what Revelation chapter 21 is outlining. That old order passed away. What was Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13 was saying, what is growing old and is ready to pass away so that the new would come into fruition. That's all of that. that again, that we're having is a narrative problem this evening in understanding what the transition of the reality of the people of God was. And essentially, that's what preterism is asserting. That it's not about that your physical reality is bad. We see tears, sorrow, mourning. I live in the same world each and every one of you do. However, I also live in a different world than some of the people in the world. You see, I live in a whole new reality because that old order, the way God's people had to come under the old covenant to be their God's people, and they had sorrow and mourning and crying and death <coughs> under that old order. Again, the death we... We haven't even qualified the death this evening that is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That death is outlined in Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8 and Hosea chapter 13 verse, 4, chapter 13 verse 14. Very clearly, it's a covenantal death. That's what the people of God have been saved from. Rejoice in that. That's our reality. It's not a, we're not living in a lowly estate any longer. So we'll go to the final question. How can we be sure of a physical resurrection? if there will be, when the depiction of Jesus we all know is not Jesus at all. I would assume you're talking about the pictures of Jesus that we see? It's never changed under uh, Pope Rodrigo Borgia to look more like his son Cesare. Back in the 1500s, basically, because Arabic, Muslim, and Jewish looking people were still being persecuted and prosecuted people were getting very sour about people that looked like Jesus painted around Rome. And people were basically beating and crucifying Jesus all over again. And he made the painters repaint all of Jesus look more of a white Anglo-Saxon in the image of the son Cesare Borgia. Mm -hmm. So if he does return, how would you know if you really don't know what Jesus looks like? Okay. 
Um, well, I think that that uh, 1 John 3, 2 answers that question. When he appears, we shall see him as he is. And there's a recognition that will happen, just like on the road to Aramaeus, when they were talking with Jesus. And they didn't recognize who it was they were talking, but he explained the scriptures to them. And then finally, it says that Jesus opened their eyes and they saw, that's Jesus. We don't know if they ever met him before or if they ever saw him before, but there was a recognition, there was a perception. We understand, we see and understand, that's Jesus. And I don't, I don't, I mean, if he walked into the room right now by his physical presence, the glory of who he is and everything else, we'd all probably look, that's Jesus. That would be my assumption. May I just, yes, uh, of course. I appreciate that response. I think that was a pretty challenging question. I, I just, you know, I, I want to agree with the person that asked that question. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, it says, For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chief apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet I know in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifest among you in all things. Again, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church to warn them that you do not receive another Jesus. And again, I, I do believe it's a, um, it's a good, healthy fear to wonder that when we're hearing a lot of this coming of Jesus, the Jesus that's going to come in our future, it's a healthy fear to wonder, what Jesus will that be? Will that be the Jesus that's prophesied in our scriptures? What, what if something does occur in our society? And, you know, again, I'm speaking very, just I'm going to speak to your heart here for a moment. My mother tells me all the time about these cataclysmic things that might happen in our future. And I have to fear for my very mother that she's going to look to one of these events in the future and say, that's Jesus. And I don't want that. And I don't think anybody else in this room would want that. So we must be sure that when we're talking about a coming of the Lord, that we are indeed talking about the coming of the Lord that has been prophesied throughout the scriptures. If we're talking about a different coming of the Lord that we might not know what that looks like or we're confused or we might be confused in the future, we need to be very fearful. And that is a healthy fear to have. That concludes this part of the debate. You may applaud for these gentlemen. So we now move on to the final phase, or the, uh, we could say final arguments, but uh, closing. We'll, we'll clo closing, closing, statements. closing statements, we'll use that, because we certainly haven't been arguing tonight. This has been an awesome testament to uh, the peace and the power of God. Um, we will start with Pastor Miano closing out. I'm going to start my closing statement with an argument. Brother Stephen, and I say that meaningful, that's not me placating you with brother, by the way. I, I sense the spirit. I hope my argument for you when we leave this event tonight would be to see that the folks out here that believe in fulfillment, we are Christians. Oh, yes. I agree. I accept that. Yep. Thank you. In closing tonight, I want to exhort each and every one of you to go home and study out these details. Take the papers I've given you. Take the papers you've received through this event. Visit Brother Stephen's website, middleism.org. I'm working on it. Don't read some of the blogs he wrote about me. Um, <laughs> I know I've given you these handouts, and I, I really do. I challenge you to go home and read these statements. This is not about whether me and Mr. Whitsett are completely right in all of our views. Again, I, I believe that I'm probably wrong in many areas, and I'm willing to grow and willing to learn, as I imagine Brother Stephen is. I imagine there are areas that I still need to grow in and I'm going to continue to submit myself to the Spirit and to the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 has always produced a burden within me though. Being that the first century Jews crucified Christ because they had a zeal for God without a knowledge. They missed the promise because their hopes were off. I pray that I have exemplified a zeal empowered by knowledge this evening. That my work may impart a blessing to you. Another exciting detail that is coming soon it will be the production of this debate on YouTube. And I tell you that because I want you to watch this debate again. 
Pay attention to the discussions of Scripture tonight. The things that are being said. The reality of what the narrative of Scripture is pointing to. Seek that in your study. Understand the narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. What was Old Covenant Israel hoping for? That's what I want you to challenge yourself with. What were they hoping for? Again, Romans chapter 15, verse 8. It was the promises given to the forefathers. The way you're going to find the answer is by reading the Old Testament. You have to find it there. If I may add a personal plug, I might be three now. However, I produce works that I believe in, so I feel that's okay. Um, I'm publishing, actually this past year, I preached here at Blue Point Bible Church through the entire Bible. Some of you would probably listen to that and disagree with me in certain areas. That's fine. However, I believe it's important to understand the narrative of our Bible. And one of the works I'm looking to produce in the near future is returning to our first love, helping us understand the narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And also I have a, a quick publication on the book of Revelation, Clarity in Revelation, that I believe helps us understand these details. What you've seen tonight is two men of God willing to challenge ourselves in regards to the scriptures. I believe I brought before you that Jesus went into heaven in the clouds and therefore, as the angel said, he would come in the same way he left, hidden in the clouds. I believe I put very clearly before you what was happening in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the gathering together of God's people in the spirit. Again, the AR word, not Oranos, the sky. Brother Stephen and I would have to admit, if we were to be honest with church history, that there's a whole lot of confusion in regards to church history. There's a whole lot of confusion in regards to when the book of Revelation was written. Church fathers seem to be very divided in regards to when the book of Revelation was written. On Mr. Whitsett's website, he quotes Mr. Max King, a much respected man within the preterist movement, if we're to call it that. The founding lie of preterism. A weakness of a lot of biblical eschatology is the tendency to ignore the time element of a prophecy simply because the historical events of that predicted time do not match our concept of what was to take place. It is more likely, however, that our concept is wrong rather than the timing of the prophecy. And that's what we're putting before you. That's what I'm putting before you this evening. When we look at Revelation chapter 21 through 22, which I would pro I tell you that that is your reality. Own that. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Adam Marshall uh, did a great presentation. Again, pronouncing the last name wrong, apologize. Um, did a great presentation on that earlier. When we look at Revelation chapter 21, and I'm just going to read through the text here. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw John, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven and saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and shall be their God. And God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There shall no, be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. There shall no more, be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that has sat upon a throne, behold, I am making all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. Again, that is our covenant heritage. It's the transition from the old heaven and old earth into the new heaven and new earth. The Jews lived in a reality of the old heaven and old earth that was characterized by physical present Jerusalem. You see this in Galatians chapter 4. The Jerusalem that was in bondage with her, with her children. The new Jerusalem is the new covenant reality that we have. Sarah. Those children are free. They are born from above. And that's our reality. What you're reading about in Revelation chapters, chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, is our covenant heritage. That old order has indeed passed away. As you continue in Revelation chapter 21, I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings and the prophecy of this book. Again, this is simply bringing the saints to the reality that they were waiting for, the judgment that was going to occur in their time. And Jesus clearly is giving you a time statement that he was coming soon. And again, I know Brother Stephen and I are in a disagreement in regards to the book of Revelation. However, Revelation chapter 11, there's a temple 
And that temple no longer stands. I was a missionary. I went to Israel. I got to see the Wailing Wall and wasn't allowed to go any further than that. And um, again, the temple's not there. What temple is John measuring in Revelation chapter 11? Also, as was posited this evening, the events of the destruction of Jerusalem are not mentioned in the book of Revelation, which makes it seemingly impossible for the book of Revelation to be written after those events. <coughs> the new Jerusalem is our current reality. That is the new covenant. Again, Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. It's going to start there. Revelation 21, 22, and it says this, And I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were the temple. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, nor the, to shine on it, for the glory of God lights it, and the Lamb is the light. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall never be shut all day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall no wise enter anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination, makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, that is all covenantal. The Lamb's, Lamb's book of life is a covenantal promise that is Moses spoke of, the book of life. There's a context to the book of life that we must uncover. Again, a Hebraic context to those details. What we read about in Revelation chapter 22, the healing of the nations. Again, I, I, many beautiful presentations brought forth this weekend in regards to what those details are. That we have the healing of the nations now. We now have access to the tree of life. We have been restored to the reality that Adam was removed from due to sin. Thank God for Jesus. This is not a lowly reality again. I want to remind you that you are living in a glorified reality, not a lowly estate. Own that reality. And recognize that Revelation chapters 21 through 22 are our reality. In the kingdom of God, in the new Jerusalem, there are those that are outside the gates that are in dire need of healing. Let us use those leaves to heal the nations, the gospel. Let Jesus Christ, the tree of life, reign. I thank you for coming tonight. God bless you. Pursue Christ and study to show yourself approved. Thank you. Mr. Wizard, you will have eight minutes. Ooh. All right. Uh, um, something I'm going to mention real quick, no offense. He said when he appears in Acts 1, he said he will be hidden. And the text says that he will appear. And appear means manifest. So just, okay. Anyway, um, if you've listened to what's been going on, what's been said, here is the main difference, and I hope that you've noticed this. And I've talked about it briefly. The futures come from a physical, literal understanding of scriptures. The preterist comes from a covenantal viewpoint. The dispensational, that is also a system. Remember that they're saying that God worked in certain dispensations and he put it all together. And then they take the Bible and they fit it into that system. Correct? Predators does the same thing. They look at this overriding thing and they, they put it into that system. Many of the scriptures that I brought up and I talked about, he says that it's spiritually it's talking about the new covenant. Well, how many times are we, do, does he have to talk about it for us not to understand it's about the covenant? And it, what I'm meaning by that is, is that it's almost everything that I brought up that kind of challenges what's being said it's taken back to the context, it's about covenant. How many times did Paul need to repeat that for us to understand that? Because he did explain it quite well in Hebrews about coming out, the new covenant passing, and, and those things. There are some very specific things that he said in very literal terms. So like when we come to 1 Corinthians 15 and somebody asks, well, what kind of body is the resurrection? What kind of body do they come? Or if he even starts the whole argument, some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Well, how can you say? If God, Christ has not been raised, how are you going to be raised? Well, Christ was never raised to new life in Christ, so how was Christ raised? From the grave, from the body, out of the grave. And he identifies that one-to-one. -one. But 
they, this, the system says, well, that was from out of the old covenant into the new covenant body. And you see that difference of how we interpret and how we look. So, that, so what we're doing and what we're saying then is we're approaching scriptures with a, a theological system that we understand this is what it's about. And so the, the futurist, yes, we tend to look at the literal words and, and look at the meaning of those words and, and, and try to pull them out. Yes, air. That's what it means, the air that we breathe. And when you look at other passages, you know, you throw the dust up into the air. Christ is going to meet us in the air. It's the same sky, it's the same place. The sky, air, he's coming down. It's the same breathable air from, you know, here. So, that's what I'm saying. The same Jesus will appear. And I look at the words and the definition of words. And we talk about exegesis. And I know Ed talks about, he'll, he gives you the Greek or he gives you the Hebrew and he says this is what this means and what this means in context. And if we look at certain words, they're specific to a certain thing and, and they define it that way based in, in Greek. For example, the word parousia. How many of you guys know that in Second, um, Second Thessalonians, it talks about the parousia of the lawless one? That's the word that's used. That's not talking about Christ. Or how about the other times that it's used? It's used 24 times in the New Testament. 16 of them refer to Christ. The rest of them refer to somebody who was not present, absent, but now is coming. I'm talking for the parousia of Timothy or of Titus. There's a to send them to come to me. They've been absent. Now they're present with me. Not once is that word ever used for a felt presence. Ever. And so that would be the other thing is that we're talking about the definition of words. That's where the change and those are where the differences are. And I'm hoping that, well, part of my study has been to sit there and understand that and try to figure that out. How do you apply that? And I think I, I've hoped that I can demonstrate enough that, yes, I understand how that's applied. But yes, I still disagree with that. Um, thank you for allowing me to come and listening to me. And uh, yes, I'm on Facebook. So if anybody wants to talk, yes, you can, you can find me there. And I try to do civil discussions and I don't try to put up with uh, too much of the other thing, but I'm willing to go into the lion's den once in a while and stuff, but to make a stand for, for what I believe. And it's basically that difference that I'm talking about. That's where we come to the two different points of view. Um, I think I will leave it at that and say thank you for inviting me. Thank you for me. Fantastic. I mean, there's not much I could say that uh, we haven't already felt and heard. So I thank both of these wonderful men of God for um, taking the time thank to, uh, to, to present their, their, their viewpoints. Um, and I'll just touch on what we talked about initially. I hope you're challenged. I hope you go back home and part of me, just a little bit, hopes that you have a little trouble sleeping tonight because you're in your Bibles. In your Bible studying and asking God, asking yourself, what do I believe? Okay? So we're going to close in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your kingdom. We thank you for your truth. Father, we worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus, I just declare that the church will come together and unite, Father, in this next generation, Father. That we will be bold, Lord God. That we will be able to come together and rightly divide the word of truth in a way that honors you, like I believe tonight did. Lord God, I pray over the lives of both of these men, Lord. I pray that they're blessed in every area and that the work of their hands, Father, just multiplies. I also pray for everybody here, everybody who, who, who dug in with us tonight to address this very, very important topic. I pray that the blessings of the kingdom of God just follow them all the days of their life. And from this point forward, we have clarity and purpose, Lord God, because we know we were all created with a plan and a purpose. And we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.